Hey everyone, welcome to Modern Day Debate. Today's topic is Christianity false. Let's find out by asking Stuart and Alex right now on Modern Day Debate. Alex, the floor is all yours. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so I thought this might be a bit fun to do this a bit differently to how this is sometimes done. So um, typically the proposition and the question in these sorts of debates is, uh, is Christianity true? Right? And then and the, um, the theist who's on takes the affirmative and the atheist takes the negative, right? Um, and then those debates, sometimes they depending on who, who it is that's taking the atheist position, sometimes it can seem like they um, approach it as if they don't have to make a positive case at all. They, they just have to be skeptical and you know nothing is really on them. It's all on the, the theist to make their case and uh, it's just nitpicking from the sides or something. Sometimes you get that impression with what the atheist is up to. And I wanted to do something different to that. So instead of uh, just trying to show that Stu's arguments don't work, um, I'll offer my own argument, and that's what the debate will focus on mainly. Um, so I'm I'm going to be trying to defend the proposition that Christianity is false, um, and I'll give an argument which has that as its conclusion, um, and then I'll defend the premises, and we can we can. Look at, I actually think only one of the then there's only two premises, and I think the whole thing will be about one of them and not the other. So um, right. So I guess first, firstly, before I say the argument, I just want to talk about what it means for the proposition to be true. So like uh, Christianity is false. Um, I think just really quickly, uh, in a way, that's kind of like a meaningless thing to say, because um, I take it propositions, other things which are true or false. And the word Christianity isn't a proposition. So it's neither true nor false. It's not the sort of thing that has a truth value. Um, but that's still maybe just being too too literal or something. When someone says Christianity is true, they mean that there are some key claims, key propositions um, that, that constitutes Christianity and that those claims are true. Now, what exactly are those claims? Well, it, that's not entirely clear and Christians disagree. Um, you know, is do you have to believe in the Trinity, for instance? So, I mean, so probably most Christians would say yes, but not all of them. Right? And so there are things where people will pick uh, what their doctrines are, and they'll say that's only that means you're a Christian and any deviation from that. Um, so if I was to show that Christianity is false, I can't possibly go through every single variation of Christianity and show that those are false. Um, so in a way, maybe this is a hopeless task, right? But I think my approach to it would be to say, look, there are some core uh, propositions we can identify, and I'll identify three of those. And so from my point of view, when I'm saying Christianity is false, I'm going to be arguing that these three propositions are false in particular, and they'll be, I'll get to them as we go along, but just, just that that's what I'm taking uh, the debate to be about. Okay. So hopefully that's helpful. So then I've got this argument, right? Um, two premises and a conclusion. So premise one is um, just if, uh, if Christianity is true, then a perfect being exists. That's premise one. Premise two is, if a perfect being exists, then Christianity is false. And the conclusion is, uh, therefore, Christianity is false. And so there's just two premises. I'm saying Christianity implies a perfect being, but I'm saying that a, a perfect being implies Christianity is false. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Sounds a bit odd, maybe the first time you hear that, but it's logically valid. It's just if P, then Q, um, but if Q, then not P, therefore not P. So very easy to show that that's logically valid. So there's no discussion about whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises. It obviously does. Um, so if she wants to say that the prem that the conclusion is false, um, at least one of the premises has to be false, right? So that's the only, it just has to be that way. Um, so premise one just says, um, if Christianity is true, then there's a perfect being. And uh, you could deny this premise, I guess. But I take it that that's most of the interesting stuff is not going to not going to be around denying this premise it seems to me that this is um mainstream christianity you know, most most mainstream christians think that this is right um in particular it seems to me that um philosophical apologetics kind of uh, assumes this is true right when people are arguing for christianity using things like the ontological argument or the moral argument or whatever they are assuming that there's a being who 
embodies perfections, right? Like Plantinga's version of the ontological argument assumes he has like maximal greatness, right? He embodies all of the great making properties to their maximal degree. So obviously, and or you could look at someone like um, Josh Rasmussen, who's this arguments about like argument from limits or whatever. I mean, all of this are presupposing that, that there's a per that the God of Christianity is a kind of perfect um, being, right? And, and maybe we cash that out by saying, He's omnipotent, omniscient, uh, omnibenevolent, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's the concept of God, it seems to me, that you get with mainstream Christianity. Now, you could deny that, and maybe you can even find biblical support for that denial. I, mean, I don't know, but you, it, but the denial means that well, you're saying that like Christianity implies an imperfect God, right? Not not a perfect God, anyway. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, if that's, you know, if you're listening to this debate and you think to yourself, uh, my my version of the Christian God is that he's kind of uh, petty and small minded and whatever. And that's who I believe in. Um, OK, cool. Uh, this argument doesn't work against you then in that case. So, you know, good day. So uh, we will part ways if that's what your view is, you know, no problem. Um, but everybody else who doesn't think that type of view of God is true. And they think God is like, you know, this omnipotent, um, omnibenevolent character. Um, well, it's game on, right? Because you think premise one is true, but if you're a Christian anyway. Um, so let's move on from that premise. It seems relatively uncontroversial. The controversial premise clearly is um, if a perfect being exists, then Christianity is false. Now, why why would you think that? Right. That's this is this is my burden of proof, I think, to try and motivate this premise. So, like I said, I want I want to focus on like three things about Christianity that seem to me essential to pretty much any any version of Christianity that you can come. It's not like an optional kind of fringe idea in Christianity. And pick three core concepts. Um, and I think those things are incompatible with the idea of a perfect being, right? So the things I'm going to talk about um, are original sin, um, atonement, and uh, salvation. And I think those these three concepts are key, are key to Christianity. You can't really have Christianity if those things are false. Um, but I think that a perfect being uh, is incompatible with those things. So I'll take them one by one. don't want to spend ages belaboring this because we can talk about it more. But... Um, Let's take original sin to begin with, right? And obviously this concept means lots of different things to lots of different people. So you can cash this out in different ways. And it might be that when I first talk about it, you think to yourself, no, that's not my view of original sin. And cool, if that's true, and Stu in particular, if, if that's a line you want to go down, but we can talk about what how my argument might work with a different version of original sin. But here's one version just to get the ball rolling, right? Which is that there's some story in the Old Testament about Eve eating an apple of the forbidden tree. Um, and you know, let's say that that's the original sin, and then some somehow or another, right? That leaving the details kind of vague for now on purpose, um, that bestows an inheritance of moral blameworthiness on everybody else that comes after her, right? You could, like I said, cash that out maybe in a nuanced way if you want to, but some some version of that's broadly right. That the the Christian idea is that some some original sin happened, they did something bad, and that's that's kind of why there is sin now. It's why we're imperfect and why there's like suffering and death in the world and stuff. But in particular, um, it, it, you know, if I, I kind of am born into the world with a moral deficit in the eyes of God because of this original sin, I inherit this kind of um, state it's such that everything else being equal, you know, if I don't do anything, if, if my goodness and badness kind of counted out and I was completely neutral in my whole life, well, I'm still down right because i came in you know with some debt that i inherited but merely by being a member of the human race following on from the original sin so that's what that's what it means okay so that's the, at least that's the target concept i've got in mind um and this the criticism is really straightforward it's really simple it's just that you know that's incompatible with justice right? it's just an in, unjust uh state of affairs to blame somebody for something that they didn't do um it's just straightforwardly not justice for that to happen. So the case recently in the UK, it was in the news about a guy who was in prison for like 18 years because he was convicted of a rape that he didn't do. And then there was DNA evidence and the police had sat on it for ages, and but it completely exonerated him. He just didn't do it. Um, he was in prison. He didn't do the thing that he was in prison for. And that's obviously not controversial in any way, a case of um, injustice. It's a miscarriage of justice, right? It's, it's just straightforward. It's not relative to some theory of justice that was an injustice. Every theory of justice says that was an, in, an injustice. It's just straightforward. It's like saying murdering babies for fun is morally bad. You know, that's true on everybody's theory of morality. Yeah, it's not a quirk of a particular theory. 
Um, but you know, the, uh, blaming somebody for original sin is the same as that, and it's effectively it's analogous to that. Um, I didn't do the thing that caused original sin, but I'm being punished for it. I'm being blamed. Uh, I in, I inherit moral blameworthiness as a result of that original sin. And that's just not just. Um, and a perfect being wouldn't do that. A perfect being would be just. They would employ justice when they were judging people. Um, so there you go, right? Original sin is required for Christianity, but a perfect being wouldn't embody that. So if a perfect being existed, he wouldn't have original sin. And there goes Christianity, right? There'd be some other version. So some other religion would be true if a, if a perfect being existed. Or maybe no religion, whatever, but not Christianity. Um, okay, so moving on then, we've got um, atonement. Right. So in atonement, what, what I'm talking about is um, God, uh, Jesus dying on the cross, basically. So what what that is. OK, so there's some guy, uh, some dude in Palestine in the first century died on the cross. But of course, the that action or that event is bestowed with a load of kind of metaphysical significance by Christian, the Christian tradition, such that um, instead of just being like a, the death of a man, it's um it, it has like is there some like he dies for our sins it's like relating back to original sin so like washing away the uh the sinfulness or something that we had um before and he's like doing the sacrifice for us but again my criticism is basically the same as it was in the first case that's the, that's a case of blatant injustice i mean if let's take an example suppose your best friend gets murdered by a gangster um and then the gangster gets caught and put on trial and found to be guilty and sentenced to go to prison for the rest of his life. But uh, then one of his like cronies pops up and says to the judge, how about I do that prison time instead of my boss? And the judge says, yeah, okay, let's do that then. You go to prison, the boss guy goes free, right? But that's just obviously a case of injustice, right? Because um, the, uh, why is that an injustice? Well, the, the moral responsibility didn't transfer to the crony Right, the moral, the guy who did the murder is still responsible for the murder. Nobody else can do anything that actually changes that. That's not how morality works. We can't swap it for something and buy your way out of it. So, punishment, the punishment is deviating from where the responsibility lies. It's going to somebody else, um, and that's why it's an injustice. Because basically, justice is about assigning to people what um, they're owed, right? What what they should get. Um, in this case, obviously, the, the, the murderer should be punished and the, the crony, maybe the crony's guilty anyway, but he's going to prison for a, a crime he didn't commit, right? So that's an injustice. But then, okay, I'll be quick, but let me just get to, if, if that's okay, just one or two more minutes and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, so then, right, what? So that's analogous to Jesus standing in. Uh, if, if I'm actually morally like blameworthy for something I really did, then it, it, there's nothing that Jesus can do to change that. Just like the crony um, can't actually change the responsibility being due to the uh, murderer, right? You can't stand in for somebody's, uh, you can't take somebody's moral responsibility away from them. So um, I got, so, it's, so it's another case of injustice, right? If that were to happen, um, we would call that un injustice. And yet that's what um, the God of Christianity does. But it's not what a perfect being would do because they would be just. So therefore, a just God uh, wouldn't do that. But it's crucial to Christianity. Therefore, if a perfect uh, being existed, Christianity would be false. And the, the very last one is just that um, salvation, right? In 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 Christianity, you can be saved, and therefore, well, whatever that means to you, in particular, it might mean going to heaven. It might mean unification with God, or whatever it means. But you know, you get some good thing. Um, not really just on the basis of how nice and morally responsible you were, but on the basis of whether or not you believe that Jesus died for our sins or whatever. Um, so two, two quick criticisms, right? First of all, again, that's um, morally irrelevant, whether you believe something to be true or false. Um, it doesn't make any difference. If I kill someone and then come to believe that Jesus died for my sins or whatever, that doesn't mean I'm not responsible for the thing that I did. I am. Nothing can change that, right? That's not how morality works again. So it would be like God not blaming somebody for something that they did do. And that's just another case of injustice. And secondly, um, doxax, doxastic states, that is beliefs, are always, by definition, it seems to me, morally insignificant, right? You, actions are morally significant. Like I torture someone uh, and that's that's morally bad. And maybe even 
the desire to torture somebody maybe that's morally blameworthy too um but believing that you've tortured somebody is not in itself a morally blameworthy right. thing right it, it doesn't, doesn't make, make any difference, difference right, right. It, it's, it's so there's something kind of just like misfiring where God dishes out eternal um, reward and eternal punishment on the basis of like my doxastic states. So they're, they're not morally relevant. So there you go. That That's my criticism. And in both, so what I did was gave an argument, two premises. The conclusion is that Christianity is false. First premise wasn't very controversial. The second one was, but I defended it with three lines of attack effectively. And in, in all of those cases, I'm saying, that a, a morally perfect being wouldn't embody the kind of injustice that we see in the Christian story. So I'll, on that note, I'll stop. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so everyone, thanks for coming to Modern Day Debate. We are a neutral platform for topics like religion, science, and politics. Our vision is to provide a neutral debate platform for anyone so that they have a fair shot. Now, for those of you who are curious, my name is Justin. I'm moderating today. If you're wondering where James is, well, Ryan and I teamed up. We chained him to a stage somewhere in Texas because he's preparing for next week's live stage debates. If you happen to be in the area, make sure you guys go pick up some tickets. Uh, I believe the link for those will be in the description. Now, if you're not in the area, you can still support James in Modern Day Debate by uh, going into the description. There is a uh, crowdfunding campaign there to help support James financially while he's um, building chairs. We literally sent him a crate of chairs from Ikea and we gave him a really small hammer to put those chairs together. So make sure you guys hit that like button to support the channel. Uh, Stuart, are you ready? I believe you're muted, my friend. Yeah, good to go. Okay, the floor is yours. All right. Appreciate you guys for having me on, Justin, Alex. And so what is perfection is my first question, because Alex brought up some different points. You know, he brought up some incommunicable, incommunicable attributes of God. And I think the arbitrariness of us just tagging on different subjective ideas of what perhaps what perfection is lends a type of credence to God's moral standard being objectively moral perfect versus ours which we can all of a sudden just start saying you know if it's totally relative then perfection could be my own definition and i could live a perfect life in my own eyes of the strong eat the weak i mean what's wrong with that that jives fully from an evolutionary perspective of my own type of leanings and desires and so you go to wall street which is 45 minutes down the road from me and why not go ahead and cut people off at the knees? Why not do anything and everything I possibly can to make a buck? I could care less about people. It's all about me. It's all about my types of power and perhaps defending my tribe. You know, I got to make a buck for my family as well because they're my tribe. And so this idea of perfection is very subjective. And I think Alex kind of communicated that. It didn't sound like he kind of really landed on a hard line of what perfection is. So how do we even get to this idea when it comes to Jesus is somehow not perfect. Now he did give the ideas of original sin, atonement, as well as salvation, and we can break those down. But still, I, I, I would need a definition of really what is perfection to even get into this debate. And you know, he then he talked about this word justice and how there is not justice within Jesus's atonement, dying for our sins, and somehow the culpability of somebody who is done true wrong it has to remain with them and jesus standing in the way is somehow unjust when my understanding of injustice has always been against fairness against concern and love for another so again this terminology it has to be really deciphered for us all to get to the point of saying okay this is objectively wrong and he's completely right alex is when he says that jesus is not perfect that jesus is unjust now, again, he gave some good points in terms of the culpability piece and justice, but everything in Alex and everything in me wants a balance of truth and love. Truth and love. Judgment and grace. Never, ever, I guarantee you, would Alex want somehow everything just to land on judgment or justice and to have this type of legalism where it's you mess up and you better pay for it every single time. 
No. In almost any movie you see, any movie, you see a type of sacrifice being lifted up, somebody standing in the way for somebody else, somebody giving up their life for somebody else, even if that person, say, has struggled with drug addiction and a type of licentiousness in his life. No, we long for that type of sacrifice. And Jesus Christ stood in the way. He took the truck running over himself by getting us out of the way in order for us to be able to live a flourishing life here and a flourishing life forever if we choose to do so with him. So I find it interesting. Again, I think this is a tremendously Christian problem that Alex has. He sounds like a Christian when he's debating because where does he get this idea of justice and perfection? Again, coming out of ancient history, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans or any other major civilization, this idea of justice almost all the time, all the time, was the strong eat the weak. And the powerful are always the ones who are, they have a type of justice. It's natural. that It's just to have slaves, for example. It was tremendously just. It was unjust to let slaves go free because they were the ones who economically were fueling the Roman Empire and, and many other civilizations. So justice, yet again, Christianity comes around and you have Jesus Christ dying on a cross, becoming a slave himself, getting in the way himself, the God of the universe, in order to lift up the slave, in order to lift up those who are considered the least of these. And that became attractive to the entire known world. Yes, many fought still against it. But the conversion rate by the thousands based off of that love, that type of justice combined with love, where Jesus came and said, yes, you are culpable. Yes, you have done wrong. And your wrong is not just a type of, oh, cursing somebody out in traffic. No, your wrong is the equivalent of doing a, a mass shooting or worse. And so he called out the wrongs, the bestiality. He called out the sexism. He called out the socioeconomic game playing and climbing up on the, the ladder in such a way where you had to beat somebody out. No, he called for equality of all. He had the strongest sense of humanism. He had the strongest sense of understanding what is agape love and how we are to sacrifice for others and how we are to stand for justice. But justice has to be paired with sacrifice. It has to be paired with a type of humility. None of us want to walk around with a string and a little recorder tied to our necks where we say, this is what is just all life long. This is what is morally correct all life long. And then at the end, play back that recorder and see if we could hold ourselves, our lives and what we did to that very standard of what we call just and perfect. No, there was only one per person in, in the history of the human race that was perfect and just, and that was Jesus Christ. The combination, for example, in the Roman Empire, how the left saw him as corroborating with the Romans as a very bad thing. But then on the right, politically, you had so many of the legalists, so, so many of those even in Jesus' camp who hated how he would get down in the dirt with those who like the woman at the well, for example, or for the lame. So Jesus's incredible combination of getting with different tribes and groups, saying and calling out the lack of justice, and then calling out what is good is what changed the Roman Empire for all people. He was the perfect form of objective truth that is exclusive, but in the most inclusive kind of way, where he was standing for truth and justice, which yet again, Alex is taking off the fumes of what he talked about. That's what secular humanism is. It's just taking off the fumes of Judeo-Christian values that Christ put in place. And he's saying it is the most inclusive form of exclusive truth because all are welcome and yet all are to be held to a standard of what is truly right and wrong which is what Christ lived out. So why wouldn't he take the sins of the world on himself? Why wouldn't that type of sacrifice change the world? I know many atheists who become Christians based off of the sacrifice, the atonement and the cross. One of them being Dostoevsky. When he walked into a Catholic church and saw Jesus on the cross and the atonement shook him to his core, one of the most brilliant minds in the last 500 years. Dostoevsky's looking at 
the cross itself and saying, wow, this is real justice because of the sacrifice of the God of the universe taking my sin upon himself because I know I do wrong every single day, putting it on himself and dying, putting himself on that cross in such a way where he is standing in my place for the wrongs I've done. That is justice. And so Alex is pushing back against what Dostoevsky said right there. Alex is closer to Tolstoy, who I believe did become a Christian, but Tolstoy was heavy on the legalism side. I don't think he fully understood grace. And yet again, he did come to a knowledge of Christ. So this all leads again up to God's love. Alex mentioned a few of the different attributes of God's love, and he truly is a God of love because he created this entire place. He created this entire place in such a way where we are all created in the image of God. Every single person, not just some, we see the incredible breakdown in our society today because so many people think that they are just truly created in the image of God, or, or they would say something else that is higher than another group. No, that's unjust. That is completely unjust. And you take any group today and the breakdown that you see and the type of standing for justice that they have when truly it's a type of anger fueling this justice because there's no type of grace behind it saying, you know what? I could see myself sinning like that. You know, that person's a racist. Doesn't mean I'm not going to befriend them in some kind of way and hopefully they'll change. Oh yeah, I would never ever be racist. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would never break in and steal. Oh yeah, 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 I would never ever cheat on my taxes. That's setting up a type of moral superiority in the name of being just, which causes the breakdown in society that we see today. So there's a direct correlation with growth in secularism and growth in bigotry and growth in legalism and growth in fundamentalism. I'm not saying there aren't parts of Christianity that don't struggle with the same, absolutely. But if you get to the roots of the atonement and those who truly understand the cross, now you have no excuse but to live in such a way where you do stand for justice, but there's forgiveness underneath it. And if you don't have forgiveness, grace, and love underneath seeking for justice, I would say you're not really seeking for justice. You're seeking for revenge. And we see that with BLM. We see that with so many other groups. Many of them, I think, are, are seeking in such a way where, where they're trying to go after what is just. And yet again, it's, I'm going to stand up just for my tribe. You've done something wrong. I would never do something as wrong as you would. And so there's complete breakdown. I see this on college campuses all the time. My TikTok channel is just my name, Stuart Connectly. You can see all of them there and the type of moral superiority that so many people have because they're standing for justice. And so we need to exclude so many different groups of people because I have what is just. And the strange thing though is they'll back that up with, but your truth is your truth. Stand for your truth, I'll stand for mine. And yet they sound like they have tremendous moral objectivity and clear discernment when it comes to what this whole justice thing is all about. So God's power, yes, has limits. You know, he can't make a square circle. He can't use power to pardon everyone. So he is a moral being like Alex is talking about. There is justice behind that. Thank heaven. And you have to have justice. You have to hold somebody accountable if you're truly going to love them. So that part of what Alex said is I can get fully on board with, you know, a husband who cheats on his wife. There's got to be two different types of things that happen. One, she's going to have to forgive him if there's going to be re true reconciliation. And then three, he's going to have to understand his wrongdoing. If those two things happen, then there can be reconciliation. There's grace there and there's justice there and willing to repent. That's what you need. That's what our hearts long for in this universe in order to have reconciliation, in order to have true flourishing in this life. So morality is not tied up in God using his power to forgive us. No, it's a type of repentance, we come to Christ. And by doing so, that's when we are saved. So God is good and just. And so this wrongdoing has to be paid for, um, not to anybody, but to occur, to be paid in a sense on that cross. And you still have to come to believe that Jesus not only was a person, perfect person, but that he died on the cross for us and that we ultimately were culpable for it. And yet he stood in our place. And I don't see any lack of perfection in that. I think it's grasping at straws to say somehow 
we have to pay for that. And Jesus was lacking understanding of what justice was because we haven't paid for it ourselves. That doesn't jive with our character. Everything in this world we long for sacrifice. We long for standing in the way for another. I would immediately sacrifice for any one of my daughters and hopefully my wife and many others beyond that. Obviously my wife as well. Sacrifice is the most beautiful thing in the world. You have to have it. When we look at and try and get after this perfection perhaps and true justice, we want to see sacrifice behind it. We want to see grace behind it. When I see an AA grace offered as well as truth and accountability, that's when change occurs. It's not just this justice and truth and accountability that is going to truly change somebody. And we've seen this in Europe. Beatrice Webb, Webb for, for example, example. she, she was head, head of the welfare, welfare state. state. She, she said, said no. Hey, Stuart, we, I, gave, I gave Dr. Alex a couple extra minutes and you're at about the same time he had. So if we can get uh, to the end here, it would be great. Yeah, 30, 30 seconds, seconds here. here. I'll just end up taking Beatrice Webb. Webb. She, she, she said, no, it's not, not a matter of the human heart. heart. We, we, need need about about we need to go about with technology. We need to go about, about then with education. education. And she, she went, went down, down for, for, from the years, years basically just concocting in her mind, thinking that in order to change humanity, we need to have a hard level of justice and we need technology will somehow fix humanity. Somehow rationality and reasoning will, or somehow education will. And she got to the end of her career and said, you know what? It's a heart matter. And she did talk about the cross in Jesus Christ when it came to that's real sacrifice. If you really want justice, you have to have sacrifice behind it. And there's no better type of seeking after justice when you start to understand the atonement where Jesus stood for justice. And yet we understand that we need grace and sacrifice in order to get to the point where we're all seeking after justice. All right. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, just a quick reminder, everyone, to hit that like and subscribe button for us and support the channel. Don't forget, James is working hard preparing for next weekend's debates, and he is asking for all of your support. So if you want to grab yourself some live tickets or even just go to the Indigo campaign uh, in the description, uh, send your love via a few dollars. That would be fantastic. We're going to go into the open discussion um, during this discussion, everyone, don't forget to send your super chats in. All super chats presented in a respectful uh, way will be asked at the end of the open discussion. Um, let's go ahead, uh, Alex. I'll, I'll let you uh, get started. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, firstly, uh, it's it's like the hottest day of the year so far in the UK right now, which um, probably means a normal day perhaps in texas or whatever but like i'm incredibly hot and i'm not used to it so if i i might just become shinier and shinier as this goes on but you know don't be alarmed it's fine it's just it's hot in here um all right cool so i wrote down some of the things you said then Stu. S Stu is or i don't want to shorten your name if that's not what people refer to you as sure. Stuart or Stu. whatever you feel most comfortable with okay cool um yeah so i wrote down a number of the things that you rose there so we can go through them i think obviously throughout a number of different things and some of them i just i just want to sidestep because i think they discussing them would take us too far afield and it, if it's okay with you to just try and stick on uh things that are closer to the the content of, of the argument that i was giving you know the historical origins of christianity how come it spread so quickly blah 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 i, I just don't think that's necessarily relevant to what we're talking about right now so i it, maybe i disagree with you about that but I, I, let's just park that right um but in particular i did think there was a couple of things you brought up so first very first thing you said was you know what what do i what more my uh, meaning when i say a perfect being what what is perfection it uh, was the way you put it so i think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, thing to do to, to query a term that's used in an argument like what does that actually mean um okay so i'm not i'm not going to give you like um the necessary and sufficient conditions of perfection right like an actual definition or something because i don't know i don't have one um so you know sorry if that's what you wanted um but i i think it's okay though because all i mean really all i need to mean by this i guess is that um well, uh, as, as I said, the idea of God being morally perfect, right, that is um, someone who's incapable of doing immoral actions, right, at the, at, at, as a minimum, um, probably is all I need, right? And I think that I don't, maybe God is, you know, maybe let's just drop the notion of per perfection, but let's just say that 
God is, um, or but you know, perfection in general. But let's let's say that God is morally perfect, and by that we just mean it's not possible for Him to do anything morally wrong. And I think that maybe um, this is also fairly uncontroversial that you know a judge in um, a, a standard like terrestrial kind of uh, court setting, um, a judge that dishes out patently unjust judgments is thereby doing an immoral action as a result. That's not what a judge should do. Right? They're doing something they shouldn't be doing. So if God were doing something like that, he would be doing something immoral. And a perfect being doesn't do that type of thing. So I don't need to tell you, I mean, whatever else perfection means, it with the very minimum, we mean he's moral, morally like perfect. And whatever else that means, it certainly means not doing immoral things. And it just seems clear that judging in the wrong way, getting your judgments wrong. I mean, maybe, you know, obviously, obviously you could get a judgment wrong because you, you know, don't have all the facts or something. But assuming you do have all the facts and you just like make the wrong judgment. That's a failing of a judge. It's a moral failing of a judge. Um, so it's the sort of thing that a, a, a perfect being like this wouldn't do. So I don't think I need to give you like a definition of morality, a definition of perfection. We just need these tiny little bits of the ideas to get the argument going. And I don't think any of those are controversial. And what, how does that sound to you? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, a big part of this, you know, you get so many words, like like ransom, for example. Mm -hmm. Ransom, you pay someone else. You know, there's a third party. Um, typically involved, obviously, here in the case uh, with God and us. So, so there's just two parties without God, but there's a third party here. So, so like, why ransom why is there a buying back the atonement and you could take the example of like you know, a man on a life raft if a man decides to to jump out where there's many people in this life raft he's paying a high price for others to live and, and he's paying a, a third party so so much of ransom and buying back redeeming it's it's metaphorical it, it's a it's a figure of speech and it's not Sorry, if somebody jumps out of the boat, I, I'm assuming you're talking about like a boat that's going to be sinking if he doesn't jump out. So he like altruistically jumps out. So that they, how is that a case of ransom? What's that got to do with a ransom? Because he's willing to give up his life in order to save those in the life raft. That's that's the case of altruism. But a, a ransom is where somebody kidnaps somebody and then says, you need to pay me this money if you want them back. And that's not what's going on in this case. So again, right? it's. it's Oracle and a figure of speech, I would say ransom theologically is sure, sure, that's one definition of, of a ransom, for for example, but I would say ransom is closer theologically in the Greek to a redemption and buying back. And so this person jumping out of the life raft is willing to make a ransom in such a way where he's buying back these people's lives because they were going to lose their lives. Okay, so there's this ransom theory of atonement, right, which is that um, God is effectively like the kidnapper. He's like demanding a payment to be paid in order to release us from uh, the sin. That's like a ransom because it's like a kidnapper who's got you and he demands money to release you, right? So there's a, a straightforward case in which, you know, that's how the ransom theory of atonement works. Um, so we can talk about that if you like, but I just don't see that the case where the guy jumps in the water to save his fellow boat goers is it's not a good example if you want to illustrate the notion of a ransom because there's no third party. Like, who's he paying? He's not paying anyone. He's just saving those fellow people, but there's nobody he's giving the payment to. So it couldn't be, it's not a good case, not a good candidate for a, a ransom. No, but he must have a third party in the ransom. But I think the exact point is... God, it would be that third party taking on our sin in such a way where, sure, where obviously we would not be. See your your example with the judge. There there are examples I've heard of where the judge gets out of the seat, comes down, and says, "I want to take this person's moral failings upon myself, and I want to go to jail for this person." And you would say that's unjust. Yes. Now, there's other examples of say the A and E church when it got shot up, and there was that group of black people in, in the Charleston church. And they said, we want to forgive Dylan Roof and we want him even to come to our next Bible study. So you would say that would be unjust if he actually came to the next Bible study. 
But here's Not necessarily. The, I don't I, know that that's unjust. If if Roof didn't get a type of penalty and prison sentence, then that would be unjust. But we're dealing with the God of the universe here versus humanity. And I think you're trying to take Jesus's humanity and just say, see, he's imperfect just in his humanity. And I might be able to get on board with that. But you're failing then to realize that he was God and man. He wasn't just man. And so if he's just man, I would agree with you on what your real issue is here. But if he's God and man, then that changes the ballgame completely. Okay, well, let's come back to that in a, in a second. I um, on the so I think there's this very plausible kind of reply. I think I discerned it in what you were saying there, which is that like um, sometimes the application of justice can be tempered by um, other virtues like mercy, for instance, or, or you might say grace or something, um, where some someone might like go look. Uh, according to the strict interpretation of the law, I've got to put you away for like 10 years for this crime, but I'm going to be nice and just give you like five years instead or something. And then that like lesser application of the full force of the law can be seen as a merciful act, right? And instances where people forgive people for crimes like you were bringing up there, like a shooting case or whatever, where somebody says, I'm going to like completely sort of forgive you and, and not re- demand a payment that the justice would would require or something. I mean, okay, fine. So let's suppose that that sort of um, sometimes mercy overwrites justice, and that's still morally perfect. It's the sort of thing a morally perfect being could do. Uh, okay, I think I find that kind of plausible, actually. So there's something kind of um, maniacal about just strictly adhering to the letter of the law all the time, so it's bureaucratic almost, right? There's something like weirdness to that. Um, but let's just, it just seems to me, look, if we think about, say, just focusing in on original sin. So justice demands that we don't get punished for things that somebody else a thousand years ago, whatever, I don't know how long it's supposed to be, 6,000 6, years ago did. It's got nothing to do with me. So justice should demand that I'm not punished uh, because I'm not morally responsible for that. Um, but you might say, uh, well, yeah, but justice. God is uh, sometimes merciful, right? And the mercy, like, um, can temper the application of justice, like we just talked about a moment ago. But, like, uh, what difference would mercy make in this case? If mercy was employed, it would point in the same direction, right? It's unjust to punish me for something I didn't do. And if you want to be merciful, you'd also not punish me for something I didn't do. It's not like mercy changes the equation differently. It doesn't mean that somehow I should be punished. Mercy doesn't help your case there. It makes my case even more. So... If what we're talking about is this appeal to mercy tempering justice, I am quite sympathetic to that. I just don't see how it helps, especially when we're talking about original sin. Maybe it may be it's a bit more plausible when it comes to the atonement idea, because that's, you know, maybe there's some, some, some mercy is like wrapped up intrinsically with, with what's going on with Jesus there. But I just don't think it, has, it doesn't help you at all when it comes to, you know, um, original sin and probably although I haven't thought this through quite so clearly, but I don't think it would help you when it comes to salvation either. I'm not sure. No, no, maybe it would. Okay, so I'm going to give you two out of three that you could probably kind of raise the mercy get out card. But do you do you understand what I'm saying about how it doesn't help you when it comes to original sin? You see what I'm saying there? Well, first of all, mercy is too soft. I was using sacrifice and grace, like giving up your life is way, way more impressive than just mercy. And I think what you're saying is way more Old Testament versus New Testament. I mean, talking about sticking to the letter of the law, yes, Jesus talked about not a jot or a tittle will be erased. And yet you look at Matthew 19 and so many other passages, Jesus is tightening the noose in such a way where there has to be tremendous grace in the new covenant if you're going to really seek after justice, or you're just going to go about killing each other. You know, for example, you talked about salvation. I'll give another example. In the Balkans, and a friend of mine, Miroslav Volf, he's a theologian up at Yale, talked about growing up and how if there was just this letter of the law and what we believe is justice, then in these war-torn countries, you would just have the cycle of revenge. It's revenge upon revenge. You killed my parent, I'm going to kill your parent. You killed my child, I'm going to kill your child, and on and on, generationally. He said, once you enter the idea of grace and sacrifice, and that we're all 
we all have original sin, and that there is eternity out there with a judgment day. Judgment day was key, he said. Now, all of a sudden, you saw a lot of the wars start to end. But if there's not an eternal understanding of judgment day and grace, and not just sticking to the letter of the law and justice like the Old Testament, now you're going to have all kinds of problems. And so this this returns again to, Alex, I mean, okay, I need to get more so at then, what is your understanding of perfection and justice? And what do you want Jesus to have done to have been this perfect being who was perfectly just? What should he have done? Um, well, so my idea of justice here, and I, I probably can spell it out a bit, but in a way, I'm reluctant to because um, I kind of want to say, look, um, in that case I described, I made up a case about a gangster who kills your friend and then the crony goes to prison in his place, right? I mean, it's, it's not a gotcha, but like, don't you agree that that would be a blatant miscarriage of justice if that were to take place? Like, yeah, just shortly, the illustration again. So it's, gangster kills your friend. He gets yeah. tried, goes to prison. The judge finds him guilty, sent in, sentences him to like life in prison. But then the gangster's crony says to the judge, how about I go to prison and in his place, right? Let him go free and I'll go to prison for the rest of my life instead. And the judge says, yeah, okay, sure, let's do that. So the, the guy, the murderer, goes free and the crony goes to prison. And that's, that's a miscarriage of justice because what's it got to do with that guy? Nothing. You know, the murderer, he still murdered someone. He's still responsible for that. No, um, but but he's going free, right? No, no, I think you're two out of three there because because one of the biggest reasons for somebody getting tried and going to jail for life is based off of what the family decides in terms of what they want with the penalty. That's what that's one of the biggest three determining factors. And so if one of those family members, particularly the one that's really been wronged, decides to no not only do i not want him to have a prison sentence but i'm going to go freely for him that's one of the biggest pieces of justice in the legal system and you oftentimes i mean again back to back to movies and stories that i know not to that extent in terms of life sentences in prison but the life change that occurs when somebody really sacrifices in that kind of way for the crony that person's life always radically changes it's the eye for an eye makes the world go blind is when you're, again, sticking to that letter of the law and saying that that's truly just. I don't think we think I don't think you live out that type of justice in your life. If you want to get super technical, super technical, then I could see you sticking to this and, and I could get on board to an extent. But I don't see you live that out in your life. I, I think you do, truly do want sacrifice when Perhaps you've done wrong. You want grace, especially offered to you when you've done wrong. You don't want somebody to just hold you to this level of justice where, no, sorry, Alex. Sorry, you said that to your wife. Your wife's gone. She's out the door because of what you said was so heinous and wrong. No, you want to be forgiven. And hopefully that leads to a type of justice. So, uh, so I, I'm just going to kind of quite surprised that. You, I mean, so in the example that I gave, uh, it's not the family member asking to go to prison. I'm not sure that makes a difference, but I think it's more plausible for you to say that that may be still a case of justice if the you know the mother of the murdered child decides to go to prison in in the murderer's place. I mean, I don't actually think that's justice, right? I think that's just another case of injustice. Um, but focus on the one that I gave. It's not the mother of the murdered child. It's just some other gangster. He just works for the boss guy. He's gone to prison. And you're the you're it's your best friend who, who's been murdered. Are you honestly going to tell me that you'd go, oh, well, cool. I guess justice has been done. Some other guy went to prison, not the murderer. But I'm fine with that. I mean, it's not even about your emotional state. It's just wouldn't you... If you were a newspaper reporter writing about it, wouldn't you wouldn't you write your story up as a case of injustice, right? Like, I, it seems to me the obvious answer is yes. I, I, I'm amazed if you were to to try and bite the bullet on that and say no, somehow that story isn't a case of injustice, right? I I just think if you if you're going to say that, it feels like you're calling into question so much about what's fundamental to do with like the legal system, if not if not even actually moral responsibility or anything, but just like 
do you ever think anyone can be like at the end there's ever a clear case of an injustice if not this i mean this seems like the most obvious one i can imagine so uh, can we just be clear about the exact example i gave do you think that's a case of injustice yes if it's not the wrong party if it's some random guy from that side crony i completely agree i thought okay. you something else so it's just the yeah it's a it's the someone who works it's you know it's Tony Soprano did the murder and it's um, Christopher Moltisante who like takes the rap for him. If you've watched the Sopranos, right? It's just like some other gangster who's like l- lower down in the pecking order than him that does it. And there's there's no reason to think that him standing in his in Tony's place uh, constitutes justice. It's, a, it's an obvious case of injustice. And what I was saying with Original Sin is that it's analogous to that case because I'm like Christopher Moltisante. Well, no, sorry, this is about atonement, I suppose. If Jesus is like Christopher Moltisante, who's saying to God, who's the judge, Alex is is morally responsible for something, but I'll stand in his place and take some punishment that he deserves. But let me take that punishment instead, and then let Alex um, benefit from that in some way. And that's unjust in the same way, because it's not Jesus's fault. If I've done something and he hasn't, that's like Christopher Moltisanti didn't do the murder. Tony Soprano did the murder. It's the same, right? It, it, I'm a, I'm the responsible one. Jesus isn't, right? And him just saying, can I stand in his place, might be some kind of sacrificial act or whatever. But my claim is that morality doesn't, like, follow that along. Like, even though he's done that, it might be nice or, or whatever. It might be inspiring. I might become a cool, nice person if he does that for me. But moral responsibility hasn't actually moved. I mean, if if you were to try and draw a picture um, with an arrow pointing at the person who was morally responsible, it would be pointing at me. I'm the one who did the thing, right? It would be pointing at Tony Soprano. He's the one that did the thing. That's not even like, and, and just asking to take the punishment in his place doesn't change that, right? That seems to me clear. So do you agree with that principle that like moral responsibility doesn't transfer to other people? If you're just taking Jesus Christ as a human being, then absolutely. If you're taking Jesus Christ as the son of God and that he created us, and you look at, for example, Psalm 51, when David talks about, I've sinned against only God alone. So he's talking about, I mean, injustice, obviously, because he murdered Bathsheba's husband. What are you talking about, David? It's a clear example of injustice, right? No, he's talking about, he's asking for forgiveness as well, but he's saying that the God of the universe created all of us. And so ultimately he is culpable for not only offending, but actually destroying something that the creator of the universe created. And so he brings the third party into it because you have the God of the universe who created us. If you don't have that, then I'm on board fully with all of your analogies. They, They make total sense. And I would stand for them as well. But your point on original sin, if I could be a liberal for a second, I mean, I think you know, you, you have to be a liberal or illiberal. Which did you say? A a space liberal, not not a conservative. Okay. okay. I, I don't know if you are, but say if you are over here. Well, you guys are very culpable too over in your place. But say say if you, if you you know your your great great grandparents had slaves, you hold some moral culpability for that, do you not? And so, just like Adam and Eve, we hold some moral culpability for what they did. Yeah, see, I don't think that's right. So if you go back in my... Let me just finish because because the the important part here is that, yes, you're right. They messed up, but I personally believe, and I know some Christians would disagree with me, I believe that whether Adam and Eve were actually two human beings, I think there's also significance in understanding that we would, if we were in their place, we would have done the same thing. So take that metaphorically or or however you'd like, but that is also the the place of where it's not just two human beings screwed up. And so now all of a sudden, all of us have this incredible baggage. Yes, there's a part to that, but no, I I think there's incredible symbolism there and understanding that we would have done the same thing. But the important part is it's not just that. The completed story is what Jesus did on the cross for us. So he's going to complete it. So we have this darkness as well as this light where, yes, if you want to take it literalistically as a physical human being, and we're going to blame all on Adam because he screwed up our lives. 
screwed up nature, you know, sociologically, psychologically, then you're going to say, okay, in the first Adam, all sinned, we get in the Bible. But then in the second Adam, he's came, come to redeem us, to buy us back. And so you have this incredible tension where it is, we have been given a, a not a fair shake, but then I think there is fairness and justice in Jesus all of a sudden coming in and saying, I am going to give you the ultimate possibility to be redeemed. Okay, so I think I don't understand why it makes any difference who stands in for the person that's morally responsible. I don't suppose it. To me, I can't really see why, from a moral perspective, um, it makes any difference whether the person who's standing in for the person who's actually morally responsible is the crony who works for the guy, is the mother of the murdered person, or is the creator of the universe. I just don't, I don't understand how that's supposed to work. Like they don't, none of those distinctions feel like they're morally relevant, right? Because what I'm saying is, if you do something uh, bad, morally bad, like killing someone, maybe I can be like um, forgiven by everyone and I can like grow as a person by owning it and becoming like a better person and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't change the fact that I did it and I'm responsible for the action, right? In fact, the coming to terms with it thing, I would imagine involves owning that and like not hiding away from the, what you're responsible for and like really saying, yes, I did this. It was bad. I did it. Nobody forced me to do it. That was my choice. I, you know, that type of like, that's what it is to come to terms with a moral action. That's where how, what like, um, uh, like restoration or whatever, after you've done something bad involves that, like owning up to it. And it just seems to me that it, it it's owning up to the fact that it doesn't change. It can't go away. Nobody can take it from you. Now you were saying, well, if it's Jesus though, maybe there is an exception to that rule. And like, if that's right, I, I'd need you to explain to me why, um, the kind of identity of the person who's standing in for the person who's done something wrong uh, can somehow change that principle such that the moral responsibility is in fact wiped away and they stand in for them. Like, I don't get that. It doesn't seem to me that that's right. So why should I believe that? That, you know, if it's Jesus standing in for you, then he really can make it so that you're not responsible anymore. That just seems to me completely implausible. Because only the person who's created you has the possibility of doing that and secondly he is the only person who has the ability to do so because i believe the gravity of sin is so strong that it would crush any human being especially from a spiritual angle as well as a physical and so by him standing in he's saying i created you i have the ability to do this and this is going to create real change just as we saw throughout the old testament did not create change. It was an eye for an eye. And we saw all of the bloodshed that came from that. So whatever your definition of justice and moral right and wrong is, I don't know how that morality is somehow, again, objective and how we need to strive for that type of justice because that just type of justice to me is very concerning. If there is no grace and standing in the way and because it, everything even in nature whether it's a mother bear or a mother hen they're going to stand in the way of a, a perpetrator or somehow a predator in order to save their kids in order to save their cubs and their chicks okay uh, but that that's just to say that um sometimes i mean i i, I just don't, I don't think that's relevant like uh i don't know i don't suppose that animals are moral agents anyway so i don't think that they can be uh that these concepts don't really apply to them i think an, an animal could be uh treated unjustly but i don't suppose that an, an action of an animal can be considered either just or unjust right because they're not moral agents they don't know these concepts it's nothing to do with them really you have to be like rational enough to be able to grasp the concepts for it to um, for you to become, for you to progress out of being just simply a moral patient to becoming a moral agent. So uh, all of those examples about like nature being red in tooth and claw, it doesn't matter but, because um, justice, it seems to me, would apply to anything, whether it's a human or an angel or an alien or whatever, that can understand the concept enough to see that it applies to them. And once you do, then, you know, unfortunately, you're kind of crippled by the fact that you you now get it. So you have to 
um, kind of uh, follow follow along to some extent if you can, right? Like moral morality just seems to me it's like normative kind of um, requirements upon everybody to to do you know not do bad things, right? You know you shouldn't murder people. I mean I am in agreement with the that kind of chunk of uh, Christian teaching, I suppose, if you if you want to put it like that. I don't think they're the commandments that come from God, but I do think that they're objective and everybody's you know um everybody has kind of is affected by that normative um constraint that it puts on you but but look let's get back to the the point in hannah i still don't really understand so you i said why what to me it doesn't seem to make any difference if uh the identity of the person standing in for someone who's morally responsible and you said i think two things the first one was well it it, it can make a difference if they created you Right. So if you're if they're your creator, then they can stand in that in your place. And then doing so does, in fact, transfer a moral responsibility. But I mean, my parents created me just as much as Jesus did, even on your view. I think it's still true in some sense that your parents created you. Right. But I don't suppose my my father can stand in like um, Christopher Moltisante does for Tony Soprano in my example. It's still an, an example of injustice if, if my father was to try and do that doesn't matter that he created me. I don't see what relevance that has to it. Um, so it just feels like a, a claim you made, but I don't understand how that's relevant. Do you see where my problem is with that? Like, what's that got to do with trans- the transference of moral responsibility in a case like this, that, that, that he's my creator? How is that relevant? Well, that's why I, I combined it with the second point. Where what only the second one again? I actually forgot it now. I'm just waffling on too much. Only even he has the ability to take on the sins of the world from a physical as well as spiritual point of view. And so this would, his definition of justice and every single person I know in this world, like you're getting so technical from simply a rationalistic perspective where you're removing God, any type of understanding of God is both man as well as divine. But anybody I know, if we pulled a room full of people and they looked at the atonement and something like somebody standing in the way for another person and offering forgiveness and offering to pay the price for that person, I don't think many people in that room would say, oh, no, that's unjust. Do not let that person do that. We can't have that. Maybe. Is this a room full of philosophers or a room full of normal people? Because. Normal you know, people, exactly. Normal people, but am I allowed to give them intuition pumps by telling them my story about Tony Soprano first? I mean, I don't know what this kind of poll of an imaginary sample of ordinary people is supposed to tell us. Uh, I, I think they're wrong if they think that. So who cares, right? And, but then my second question to them is: We all have a moral conscience, and we all know what true justice is, and seeking after what's really right and wrong. So where do you get that understanding of your moral conscience and what is truly right or wrong? Well. I don't I don't think that everybody always knows what's just and what's not. I think there are cases that are, require very nuanced balance of considerations and stuff. That's why being a judge is a, not a job that everybody's qualified to do. Um, but I think there are core aspects to what justice is that are evident and easy to see, like the guy going to prison for something he didn't commit, right? That the, the guy was, I can't remember his name now, but... He, he went to prison for supposedly raping someone, but he didn't rape that person. And he spent 18 years in prison. I don't need to be, uh, I don't need to know everything about justice. I don't even need to have a theory of justice to just be able to plain as day see that that's obviously an unjust thing. Just like I don't need to be a moral philosopher to know that you shouldn't torture babies to death for fun, right? It's it's We can see these things as plain as two plus two equals four, as far as I can see. So I, you know, it's a bit of a red herring to say, well, what's, you know, everyone, you have to somehow know every answer to every justice question in what the about, world. Right? What about torturing babies? If you tortured my baby, why isn't that just? That's, that's a rant, you know, that, that's, that's equal payment. Yeah. So I, I don't think that justice. Um, so obviously we can get into a bit, bit about what I think, what, what my theory of justice is, if you like, but um you know, I don't think that it's just like anyone can uh, balance the scales. I don't think that it's just like you gang, you gather up a posse and go around the house and like kill them and that's justice or something. That seems to me not justice either. 
the dishing out of justice has to be done by the kind of relevant authority, or whatever that means. Um, but a judge, say, that's part of a system that's been set up. But at the very least, I mean, it seems to me it doesn't really matter about these questions, because according to the Christian story, God is obviously a qualified judge, a relevant authority. So that makes the difference. It's not like people being kind of um, vigilantes. Let's just agree that nothing, that any type of vigilante justice is actually not justice. It's a, it's a kind of false justice. For justice to be actually done properly, it's where you kind of, you have an arbiter who's a third party, who's kind of independent, who's like able to see things um, objectively and not be swayed by things on either side, blah, blah, blah. So you have to have like a competent authority. And obviously, according to the Christian story, God is supposed to be that type of authority. So we can just sidestep all those questions about like, gathering up a posse and like you know, going and kicking the guy's ass or something like let's just say they're all unjust I mean isn't, isn't that reasonable do I have to really like spell out a full-on theory of justice here it doesn't like the, the question that, that I'm bringing up isn't isn't a borderline case right it's a clear case so I, therefore I don't need a theory but, of justice I don't think it is a clear case because you just said that there are many different murky times where we don't understand what is true justice in certain situations? And then the one that really concerned me that you said was, you know, it's the authority that sets it up, whatever that means. Like, yeah. whatever that means, like Nazi Germany, they were in authority, whatever whatever that means, that's that's fine. You know, communist regimes, you know, Pol Pot, whatever, they, they were in authority. So- Right, right, so they have to be an authority, but it doesn't mean that anything an authority says thereby is, is just, right? They still, they still have to dish out the appropriate uh the judgments that i'm just saying it can't be done by like your friend bob next door because he's yeah. not an appropriate authority sorry i maybe i interrupted you i apologize for that who defines what is appropriate it in in what respect when it comes to like judges in in courts and human judges you said if I, I brought up the baby example and you yeah. said authority slash whatever that means Right. So in the human case, there's, you know, do we really want to talk about like how judges get appointed in society? Because no. isn't it the case in the theological example? Obviously, God is the judge. So it doesn't really matter how we establish judges in the human case, does it? I mean, what difference does that make? The The point we're discussing is whether God would be just to allow somebody else to, to be punished for my sins. Well, yeah. And so who, who cares how we set up judges in the actual world? Well, OK, if you want to get away from the moral argument, that's tied to our that's tied to your point in, in a very very strong way but we, we can save that for another day because I, I do want to get to your three points but okay. I, I have a problem with what you stated but you know a, a third point since you didn't like my first two points <laughs> the third point is I believe there, there's so many different atonement theories out there right so I, mm -hmm. I would believe in penal substitution that's where I land okay. so we were guilty like we're talking about we're guilty before God for our sins and therefore deserving of punishment we, we can get on board with that and then the punishment obviously is needed because we are culpable for it, for it. And there needs to be a type of ransom. There needs to be a type of buying back. There needs to be a type of expiation for our sins. So because Jesus was sinless, he could take that punishment on himself in our place. So that's my third point. It's for a free pardon of our sins. And if he wasn't sinless, then he couldn't do so. So yet again, this is getting back to the God man combination but i mean i fully understand the mystery of it i think any anybody you debate this topic on who, who gives you a concrete case is is adding to the bible because over and over you get pauline lines and christ himself but pauline lines that specifically say that the cross is a mystery that it's foolishness to those who are unsaved so there's going to be mysteries and things like the atonement as well as the trinity but your level of justice that you're holding to it so strongly and technically, I just can't get on board with when you're dealing with the God of the universe. I mean, if we're here talking about you, me, and one other third dude who's a crony, yeah, I, I would probably be in full agreement with you. Well, I, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, if you're not already a Christian, right, say you're an atheist like me, um, I, I have a bunch of, I think, common ground with you in terms of like, I don't think it's morally right to torture babies. And I think like you do that somebody getting sent to, sent to prison for something they didn't do is, is unjust. So 
it, you know, we agree on that much. There's a common ground there. And then, um, you know, what's what's wrong with me? Like, if you say, oh, and here's a Christian story, right? Let me explain it to you. There's original sin, but Jesus dies for your sin. So that makes that better. And that means you can go to heaven, right? That's the kind of thumbnail sketch of what Christianity is. And I say, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like, uh, and here here's my critique, right? That's not just, right? You're telling me there's a perfect being, blah, blah, blah. Like, are you saying that's unfairly technical as a response, right? I shouldn't be um, asking those questions and it's a mystery or something. Like, if it's a mystery, okay, well, I'm not, I, I don't find it um, attractive as a proposition then because you're basically saying, why don't you believe this story that I've told you? My critique of that is it doesn't make sense to me. And then your reply is, well, it's okay, it's mysterious. So it doesn't make sense to me either. Like, I, what I, I I'm not been... buying that product, buddy. Do you know what I mean? Like, why would I? For over an hour now, and that's not what I've said whatsoever. I've okay. just given you a piece here and understanding biblically what is stated when it comes to, yes, there are mysteries in it. And it's foolishness to somebody like you who's an atheist because you clearly don't understand the inadequacy of sin and human depravity. I mean, how deep our wrongdoing truly is and what happens if we remove the doctrine of sin in our society. So the serious doctrine of sin, then you understand it's why it's so horrible and that there needs to be a sacrifice to be offered. And I think your understanding is a total straw man when it comes to the entire narrative of scripture. It's not just, oh, original sin, and now we got the cross, and hey, this guy's just going to die for us. We're, you know, It's going to be a nice barbecue over the weekend, and now all of a sudden everything is fine, and we're all going to go to heaven and sit on nice clouds and play, you know, sharp, obviously just play nice little guitars on these clouds, and they're the little liars. I think that is such a simplistic, like, I, I have so much intellectual disrespect for people who straw man and simplify things to that extent because you completely skipped over the entire understanding of stretching for truth justice the source of all goodness versus a complete attrition and a complete opposite of that which is moving away from the source of all goodness which is what an atheist is doing. And then they have to make up their own understanding of what goodness is, which is your tremendously mishmushy understanding of justice, where I don't even know where you get it from. And your your definition of perfection was completely lacking in every kind of way. So now you're putting it on me to say, oh, it's just a mystery when your terminology from the very beginning was a complete mystery to me. And I don't think you define the terms well whatsoever. So it, the Christian doctrine is not, oh, original sin, then the atonement. No, there's a lot of pages in the Bible, I would say, before that, that have a lot to do with, you know, you talked about faith, for example, another straw man and total misunderstanding of scripture. You talked about faith versus action. No, everything in the Bible, when it comes to the original Hebrew and Greek, faith is attributed to as action. You're taking a very English American understanding of what faith is, which is just, you know, let's have faith that we're going to win the ball game on Sunday for the saints versus the Titans. That's not what faith is. Faith is an action stepping in such a way where you're trusting, say, your wife, because you've seen the actions that she's taken to meet out a type of trusting relationship that's based off of a covenant. And then you get to come to Christ, for example, and make that decision based off of the historical evidence. And if it's lacking, then then dish it away. If there's no evidence for the resurrection, then we don't even have to be having this discussion. It's totally theoretical. But if there's strong evidence for the resurrection, then again, it doesn't matter what we're having this discussion or not, because Christianity is true. Does that make sense? Um, Before you reply there, so. Alex, I real quick uh -huh. just want to say we've got about uh, nine minutes left of open discussion, and we're going to get into those super chats. So if anybody wants to get a super chat in, now is your chance. Uh, sorry, Alex, carry on. Okay, okay. yeah, no problem. So um, again, there was a lot there, Stu. So I I don't know that I'm going to be able to reply to everything you said. Um, uh, so. I suppose I still, I still just don't. Yeah, maybe am I strawmanning Christianity by simplifying it in such a way that I'm missing out some stuff? Uh, possibly that's true, right? I'm not a Christian. I'm not Bible scholar. Um, I wasn't raised as a Christian, so it's you know it's none of my business, right? But um, I don't think that what I've said is like completely wrong. And 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 if it is wrong, I you know feel free to um, explain why what I said is is wrong. And I'm, I'm, I'm when you've done that, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, look, this guy doesn't know about Christian theology, whatever. And you might be right about that, but that's not actually rebutting the claims that I made. Um, so I guess I, you know, I, I would prefer to see something like focused in on 
what I said rather than disparaging none that you meant to necessarily like insult me or something but like just even if you were right in claiming that I'm a complete idiot and don't know anything about Christianity that doesn't mean that's not actually a rebuttal to to the claims I was making right do you, do you, do you see what I, I mean like, my rebuttal for the last 45 minutes and yeah, then, yeah, but the, the last well, thing you said was I take a stance of humility saying that the Bible talks about how this is foolishness to people as well as a great mystery and then your your response to that is Ha, Stuart, that's so ridiculous. That's your entire rebuttal. You're just going to sit here and say this is a total mystery and foolishness. No, that's a stance of no. humility. I'm not being as dogmatic as you and opinionated where you're not giving any type of leeway and saying, hey, maybe I don't get this. Maybe there is a side. And this is what I deal with with so many atheists when I come on this channel, which is, oh, Stuart makes the stance of like foolishness and there's a mystery within the Trinity. I mean, he gave a lot of points showing that wow, there, maybe there is some credence to understanding why there truly was creeds and a theological understanding at Nicaea, for example. But then Stuart finished it with, there is some mystery. So Stuart's whole argument was, there is some mystery and foolishness. No, no, no. Hold on a second. Look, I'm, See I'm how not that complaining. Big... Yeah, no, but I think now you're mischaracterizing me. Because mind? dogmatic, cynical people I've ever met in my life. Okay. And that's what you need to understand. You need to start doubting your own beliefs. And then when you do mm -hmm. so, you can come to the place of saying, you know what, actually, there is a mystery here. I don't really mm -hmm. know. You know, I was raised an atheist, so maybe I'm just an atheist because my parents raised me that way. Of course. Look, I'm not saying that. You have knowledge, you know, Peter Berger. So I, I don't see that in you. Instead, I see this, this response of, Stuart, you haven't given me anything at all this whole time. You just said it's a mystery to everybody. When I'm pretty sure if we roll back the tape, I've said a lot more than just it's a mystery. No, no. I listen, I didn't say you've not said anything apart from that mystery reply. I never said that. You've said a load of other stuff and we've been talking about it for an hour. Right. And I wasn't saying that if you say that anything about Christianity is mysterious, that that somehow means that you lose the debate. I don't think that's true. Um, I, you know, I think that loads of stuff is mysterious and I kind of respect the idea that there's mystery in religion. I think, cool, that's that's fine by me. I like that idea in a way. Right. I just think that when we're talking about this specific topic about like, how is it, I thought what we were talking about was why, why think that somebody standing in for someone else um, like counts as uh, like means that the moral responsibility has transferred because to me, the crony standing in doesn't mean that the moral responsibility transfers. So you were cashing out to me. We were talking about does if you're there, the, if they created you, that might make a difference. Right. And I thought when you said, well, look, there's a mystery here that you were saying, look, ultimately that question is mysterious, right? That the specific question we were talking about, the answer to that question, not the Trinity or anything else, not that there's some mystery in Christianity, but that this question is a mystery, right? But if that's what you're doing dialectically, it sort of just means that if we run out of ground where you're not offering an actual objection anymore, because I mean, and you know, sometimes this happens. If somebody asks me, why is the sky blue? I can say a couple of explanation points about that. But if you keep asking me, I'm going to say, I, gee, I don't know. It's a mystery to me, right? And, you know, that's the end of the conversation. So it, I'm not complaining. I'm not criticizing in any way. But, like, if that's if that's the if the story, I, you know, I summarized Christianity. I gave a thumbnail. So I guess it kind of sounded like a straw man. But I didn't mean to, like, trigger you by saying, you know, this is what I think Christianity is or whatever. But, like, I gave a quick summary. And I was saying, look, and I'm making a critique about it like this. And if when we go through the dialectic, we get to the point where you go, well, th at this point, I all I can say is that this is mysterious, like this aspect of it is mysterious, then that's like unpersuasive to me, right? Because why would it be? Like if you were crit criticizing my worldview, asking me where do you get this view of morality from or something, and, I've, and after trying to explain it for a bit, I ended up saying, I guess it's just a mystery. You might then say, well, look, that's no good. It's not going to convert me to atheism, is it? If, you, if you've got no answer to that question, like appealing to a mystery there, it's kind of unsatisfying. That's all I'm saying. I'm not I, would to... be, I would be way more likely to convert to atheism if you said that. Way more likely. If you okay. say, I do not know at the end of something, I would say, wow, wow, this guy, maybe there's no emotional bias here. Maybe, maybe there's no, perhaps, efforts to straw man the other side. This guy is truly stating his case, and then he finishes with, you know, I'm not sure here. I'm not sure there. There's a good case for Christianity there. I just, I, 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 I haven't heard that from you, and I never hear that from anybody. And for you to keep saying that 
wait, I thought we were talking about the atonement is crap because you've gone to original. Oh. You went to salvation. You went, then you straw man the whole biblical narrative. Like, like I gave you my response, whether you like it or not to the atonement, we need to get on to other things as well. I'm not just going to keep sitting here with the cronies and talking about this over and over again, when you've brought up so many other points, like I gave my response. If you want to keep going here, we can, but I'm frankly, I'm getting kind of bored. Okay, well, I don't mean to bore you. I mean, if that's, uh, we can move to the Q&A if you want to. Uh... No, you brought up other interesting points. We can totally move to the Q&A if you'd like, but your other points were way more interesting in terms of original sin and salvation to me than just okay. kind of going over what the atonement is. All right, so on salvation, salvation. feels to me we didn't talk about that very just much. Just real you quick, Alex, it. on that point, yeah, we are just a couple of minutes from Q&A, so sure, if, sure. Uh, so maybe I'll, just, maybe I'll just say my, my idea, idea again, again right yeah, so it was two points on this one so, so in terms of the salvation, salvation um i think, I think that, that it 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 divorces where from, from what it seems to me, it seems to me there's moral, moral responsibility, responsibility that somebody has when they do when something say wrong wrong um and, and forgive like, like saving, saving uh, people, uh people on the basis of them believing a proposition divorces divorce that, 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 that link again. again. So that to so me that sounds like a case, case of injustice. injustice. So that was, so that was a, the, a, just, just like the other two examples, examples really. really. What, what seems to me the, the kind of proto-theory proto theory of justice that I'm working, that I'm working with, with is, is merely is just that like, that, um, um, if, if punishments, punishments and rewards are going to be applied to people, then it needs to like track with the moral responsibility. If it deviates from the moral responsibility, that's what I mean by injustice, basically. So again, it's just another case of the same phenomenon. But then I also mentioned that Doxastic, doxastic states, states like beliefs, beliefs are not are morally, morally relevant. relevant actions, actions are morally, morally relevant, relevant and possibly, and possibly desires, desires but not, not beliefs that seems, seems to be relatively straightforward, straightforward. Yeah, yeah i mean i guess I mean, you I guess want to talk i, I actually, actually didn't, didn't mention the word faith i understand why why you went to faith because maybe one i'm maybe it's the word i should have been using but it seems to me that at least at the least idea the of idea faith, faith which involves, which involves believing, believing a proposition, a proposition to, be true, to be true, right? Believing that, say, Jesus died, died for our sins or something. something. I don't see, I don't why, see why that, that is, morally is morally relevant and shouldn't make any difference, difference to, to, to a perfect, perfect judge's um, um, judgment, judgment about, about my blameworthiness, blameworthiness, whether I believe a proposition to be true or not. It should have nothing to do with it. So those are my two points there. So I'll give you the final word, Stu, anything you want to say. Any ponage you want to dish out on my argument there, feel free to do that now. Well, no, you well, said you something said... interesting about salvation when it comes to, you know, you kill someone and you had uh, this come to Jesus moment. So it's like the thief on the cross. He was most likely a murderer, not just a thief. And yet he comes to Jesus. Okay. Jesus obviously reads hearts. He's reading hearts throughout the New Testament. We get that when it comes to like the Pharisees, for example. And so it's not just this matter of mental assent of whether the Pharisees or the thief on the cross, if they have this mental assent where all of a sudden they had this, you know, vague belief in Jesus and boom, you're in, buddy, you're in. No, he only God alone can read hearts. Let, let's be honest, like, like that logically makes sense. You and I can't read hearts. We can get to know each other after a long time, but we can't really know the real Alex. You can't really know the real Stuart. Not even my wife knows the real Stuart, thank heaven. And so this is a matter of he reads hearts. Always love and belief are tied to action in the Bible. So again, like love songs we have in our culture today are all tied up in emotion and love is emotion. But the Bible, biblically speaking, it's about action. Like Acts, for example, talks about pistis when it comes to moving out in trust in relationship with God, giving up yourself in order to have a tight relationship with him. Again, it's not just this mental ascent to believe in your in, believe in your in and have this mental goal ability. And then you're in. You also said, so you're still responsible it's like God blaming someone for what they or God not blaming somebody for what they did, which is entirely untrue. God never lets anybody off the hook. That's why, for example, you get the ultimate combination of justice, truth and love at the cross. And that's the definition of what real justice is when it comes to understanding what we desire today. Now, if you want to say just in our legal system and our legal system changes over the years, we know this. Then our legal system standing today in the U.S., yes, I'd get closer to your understanding probably of, of justice. But that's not the one I'm going by. I'm, I'm going by a type of objective system that I think all of us truly desire if we're really honest. And I think it is ethereal. 
I think it is immaterial. I, I think mm -hmm. it is a type of standard that comes from God. And so it's in that kind of way, it just makes more sense. The beliefs are always never morally significant. Again, I think beliefs in scripture are tied to action. So it is morally significant. Torture is morally blameworthy, you said. Um, believing isn't. I Again, I would agree if it's just believing is, is mental assent. God dishes out eternal reward and punishment based off of belief, which is not true. God dishes out eternal reward and punishment based off of our free will, whether to come to him or not. And the ultimate act of love is respecting somebody's free will. And if you, Alex, make the free will based decision to rule in heaven, or rule in hell rather than serve in heaven. And I don't necessarily think you're a narcissistic guy who's like, oh, I just got to live for myself. And somehow I want to own a rule in hell. No, I think it's much more complex when it comes to believing in God, obviously, or, or not. But what is what do you worship? Every single person worship. David Foster Wallace, a strong atheist, said that at Kenyon College here. Every single person worships. And it's, if it's something transcendent, it won't eat you alive like if it is something mundane here on this planet. And so if you worship the source of all goodness, based off of his grace and the ultimate act of love on the cross, see, that's going to draw you to heaven, his love on the cross. It's not going to be this type of justice. Alex did right and wrong, this Old Testament and uh, the Canaanites had a very similar type of justice system, right, wrong, kill him, capital punishment if he's wrong and if he's done wrong to somebody else. No, we want something else. I think the God of the universe is drawing us in such a way where he wants our hearts to really desire him and the good. And so much of that is based off of grace and sacrifice. And somebody actually has to be the God of the universe standing in the way for us taking on our sins because he's the sinless one nobody who is sinful can take on the sins of somebody else it has to be somebody sinless and it has to be the god of the universe okay can i just ask one very quick question to which i don't want to have a huge discussion and like follow up blah 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 just a very okay, quick question I'll, just I'll, like... I'll, I'll allow the question that we'll get to the q a right after oh, Stu absolutely. after stewart's response obviously yeah i just wanted to ask you Stu, do you think that you can um you know, go to heaven or whatever the um, the good the good option is um, in Christianity, entirely having uh, the wrong beliefs, right? Is you know, is is that possible? Entirely having the wrong beliefs like Again, about Christianity. I just don't believe any of those core beliefs. Am I excluded from heaven as a result of that? So, ba so I, I go by Kant and the Apostle Paul, Romans one and two based off of the knowledge of truth that's been given to you, based off of your decision off of that, and based off of the beauty and nature and creativity of what we have given to us, that's going to determine whether you decide to follow your moral conscience, for example, like Paul and Kant talked about, that's connected to God. That's going to determine whether you go to heaven ultimately or not. It's not going to be whether you truly got the doctrines correct or not. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, once again, everyone, thank you so much for uh, accepting my challenge of hitting 100 likes before we got to Q&A. Thank you. That feels fantastic. Um, Stuart and Alex, you guys are monsters of debate. Thank you so much for coming out. Let's get to some Q&A, shall we? Um, actually, before I jump into that q and I remind you guys one more time. Next weekend, we've got the live in-person debates. Um, in Houston, Texas. So if you guys want to grab some uh, some tickets to the event, simply just go to the description below and click the link. Um, we would love to see you all there. Uh, Stuart uh, from 111 for 699, explain how a perfect and all loving God believes eternal punishment is the perfect punishment for finite sin. Well, I lean towards annihilationism. I, I don't, I'm not certain, I've gone back and forth, that it's going to be eternal punishment. We get both in scripture. So so that's another mystery. But I, I for me, it's not a finite sin that you're going to be damned forever for. No, read, I would, 111, go check out Luke 16, Father Abraham. He, he's not in hell because of a finite sin. He's in, or excuse me, yeah, the rich man, Father Abraham, Luke 16, He's the rich man is not in hell because of a finite sin. It's because he lived for money. He doesn't even have a name. So it's kind of that idea of born a man, died a doctor. A lot of doctors get the poor reputation of, I'm just a doctor now. And I don't even, I've lost my humanity because I've lived for that type of esteem. So 
so that it's it's what you're living for ultimately puts you in hell. It's it's not a finite sin. All right, thank you. Uh, another uh, maybe more of a comment than a question. I don't know from Big Thang Flying Wayne. Did Stu equate any sin to omitting mass shooting? No, no, that's not what I did. I was talking about the need for Jesus to die on the cross. See, that was an angle that Alex and I didn't get to. But the need, like the gravity of sin, I would say him taking it upon himself, you know, him sweating and praying, you know, to the point of droplets of blood three times in the garden. That level of pain taking on that type of sin, I would say the potential and what we have in us for sin, if it's fully realized, so it's like an acorn turning into an oak tree, turning into a forest of oaks, if fully watered and fertilized correctly then yes, we could be mass shooters. And so, no, I don't equate any sin. I don't know how he worded the question, but that that's my point on that. It's not it, its not the finite sins that is the equivalent, I think he said, of, of mass shooting somehow. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Good Question for $2. Why God feared Adam? Genesis 3.22. Is that even a question? Who's that for? What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, it's, that's all it says. Is from someone called Good Question. It says, why God feared Adam. Genesis 3.22. I certainly don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Did God all fear right, Adam? That doesn't even seem right. Maybe it says that somewhere. Well, I don't know, Stuart. Are you going to look up the reference? Man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. Oh, okay. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat life forever. So it kind of seems, I, yeah, it's a good question because it kind of seems petty in a way where God's like, man cannot become like us. But it makes all this sense in the world because there has to be one God. You know, we, we we can't all be gods. And he set it up in such a way where he did create us. So he did not create all of us to be God. He didn't create all of us to be him. He created us in such a way where we are, are human. And we can flourish truly. He wanted to share this place with us. He didn't need us in any kind of way. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was Adam and Eve ultimately deciding, yes, God does not have our best in mind. And so we're going to doubt that. And we want to become our gods ourselves by testing God and wanting to know what he knows exactly. And so was there a healthy level of fear that God had towards Adam for doing that? I wouldn't it, No, The text never says he was fearful, but the text does clearly state that Adam obviously did a big misstep. And by doing so, there has to be this differentiation between God and humanity. And God's not going to let Adam become God. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, another one from good question, $5. Good question is digging deep here. Stuart, are you still waiting for Jesus' prophecy in Mark 9-1 to come true? Jeez, all, this, all these verses. Wow. The atheists read the You do not know every verse off by heart. <laughs> not an apologist, are you? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that was about the coming of the temple and then the destruction of the temple. So there was a, a, a mistaken understanding. Jesus is not saying that some of you will not. So, so that, that's one interpretation. And then others would say that, no, some were taken up to heaven from that group of people. But I believe that's more so a matter of reference to the temple, 70 AD and the destruction of it. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So then we got one from john for four dollars and he said nothing so i guess that's just a shout out we'll wave to john um but then john does ask for another five dollars Stu, why just justice require sacrifice direct succinct answer please why does justice require sacrifice uh it appear that's the question yeah Justice, there doesn't always have to be sacrifice in this type of way in justice to preserve justice. But I would say in just about any type of 
area that I can think of, if, if you're related this to forgiveness, for example, and, and wrongdoing, if somebody is going to truly forgive somebody who's wronged them, then there needs to be taken on a level of pain and a desire not, not to pay back in such a way where there is justice being done. Because when I, for example, was really hurt by someone I, I know, I could have gotten justice by going after him legally. I mean, maybe Alex would have said if, if he legally harmed me, I, I should have done that for justice sake. But no, I, I took the penalty on myself. Um, I'm not saying I was Christ in any kind of way. But I took the penalty on myself in that and did not respond in a way where that form of justice was sought out. But my uncle, for example, said he would have done so. And he's a lawyer. So there's different understandings of justice. And they're complicated, like Alex was alluding to earlier, in terms of there's nuanced situations. So that's a that's a very concrete, very clear and concise response. So can I just tag on a little bit there, not to like have a massive debate on this question, but I just no, I, maybe I, maybe I didn't say very much about justice. Um, and I I think I just don't see. OK, so so, yeah, there, there are probably it's probably a policy must word justice, right? Like like knowledge or, or whatever, where there's loads of different concepts and we just use the same word and it's like an umbrella. And often we don't distinguish uh, distinct concepts when we use the word so like i'm totally down with that idea um but i think the concept of justice that's relevant when we're talking about a kind of theistic old metaphysical judgment like what's the point what's the meaning of life in some way it's to like go through this trial and maybe you pop out the end of that trial um in sorted into like the good category or the bad category i'm not saying this is not just christianity obviously it's loads of religions that have this idea in it um so, so in that type of context um it does seem to me that like well you've got to like make you've got to sort the apples into one of the two buckets right and like what are you doing to make that decision it's not what color hair they've got it's not how many friends they've got how many in how many likes they get on their tweets or whatever the only thing that's really relevant is whether or not they were a good person or a bad person. And what that means is whether they did uh, morally right or wrong actions and to what extent they did those things. I just don't see that anything else is relevant. Like, I don't know why. To see, that's my fundamental, like, I guess that's my idea of justice that's going on here. But just like in the justice system, where often we're making uh, similar, but I guess different, because sometimes things can be legal, but immoral or illegal, but moral, or whatever. But we're still trying to say, somebody's like living up to or failing to live up to these like um standards that we've got whether we call that the law or whether we call it morality or something it just seems to me in the metaphysical case where there's a god judging us it's obviously morality it's not going to be like some legal system that men came up with right it's not going to be how many friends they've got it's not going to be what they believe it's what they do like are they did they do bad things right and um if they did that's the basis on judging them. So it's not very complicated as a theory of justice. It just seems to me perfectly straightforward and clear. Um, so, yeah, maybe I just needed to spell that out. Maybe I should have spelled that out earlier on in the debate. So apologies if not doing so meant it was more difficult to follow what I was saying. But, yeah, there we go. I just thought I would put that there so that it was I said Do you want to basically. piggyback something on that, Stuart, before we move on? No, that, that was good and clear. I would just say... You know, where does that justice come from? Like, like Alex is stating, you know, does it come from my own definition of justice? Does it come from culture's definition of justice? You know, because I, I know a, a lot of people around here, at least, would live more so and would respect people a lot more who are getting the likes on social media than <laughs> doing right and wrong in terms of, you know, philanthropy and that sort of thing. Or is it the powerful we're defining justice? Or is it like Martin Luther King Jr. talked about in terms of the law above the law? And it's God finding what is what is just and unjust. Or so okay, so the, one very last quick point then. For me in particular, um, I, I'm a moral realist. So I think there are moral truths. Um, and, and, that's, and they're completely independent of what anybody believes, right? So it's a bit like uh, the way that a Christian thinks about it. But I don't think that there's any like divine lawgiver that's dictating those or something. So in, for me, if it was my view just to put my cards on the table, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, 
not that that really mattered in this context, because I think I was just trying to appeal to some kind of common ground notion of justice that's common to both of us, regardless of how we cash out the detail. But anyway, that was that was my intention, uh, that we could have common ground and use that concept, regardless of where it comes from. All right. At this point, we're getting super chats in quicker than we can answer them. So <laughs> let's buckle down and get to work. Uh, surprise, surprise for Stuart. If I reject Jesus, how many goats are a good ransom for my soul? Blood is blood, right? So just to your point, Justin, last time, my last debate on here with Aaron Ra, we went for over four and a half hours because we kept talking during this time. But I, so over there, that's exactly what the Old Testament talked about. So, so what would happen was there was nothing in and of itself that the goat did, but the Levites would place their hands on the goat and that would be the expiation of sin, and the goat would go out and 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 die eventually because the goat was sent out beyond the herd, and that's exactly what Jesus did on Golgotha. He went beyond the herd. He went beyond humanity. He was completely isolated and took our sins upon himself. So in the Old Testament, yep, that person's exactly right, blood for blood. But in the New Testament, we get an understanding of how grave our sins are. So everything in the Old Testament, if you look at it. All the motifs point to how everybody could not ultimately, no matter the, what sacrifices they did with that blood on those goats, listen carefully, blood on those goats, they still could not get away from this feeling of dirtiness. They still kept sinning and messing up. And so they kept trying to work to God, never were able to do so. And this is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Every other religion says you work to God. But then we understand in the New Testament that we couldn't do it. So Jesus Christ has to come and do it himself. God has to do it himself as a blood sacrifice. So that's the radical difference between the two. All right. Yeah. Um, I've seen all of your debates, Stu. And I'm, I'm very much, very much enjoy watching uh, those debates, including the R and raw one. Um, I've also seen all of yours as well, Alex. So just so you're not too left out. Um, but I'm a, I was a big fan of modern day debate and now I am part of modern day debate and I'm super electric to be here right now. Uh, having said that, um, good one. that's $5. This question's for Stu. At what moment does a soul become responsible for sin? It commits. Does a dead infant need to atone more than a miscarried child? If so, why? I do not know. This this is another one where the Bible does not answer it directly. And so at the end of the Gospel of John, when John talks about if there was every deed and thing that Jesus talked about added to this book, we wouldn't have enough. We, we wouldn't have there wouldn't be enough room in the world to to contain all the books. So this is not spoken to directly. But what it is spoken to directly is the importance, some would say, of infant baptism, not to save again, not to save that child. It's simply an inward, an inward decision of an outward expression that you're that you're doing in front of people, and I always go to the baby that was born, obviously not only out of wedlock but in sin to Bathsheba, based off the adultery and the murder. David says, "You will not come to me; I will go to you," showing that that baby born out of sin is in heaven. So yet again, God's tremendous. Grace, love, unconditional love, where it's, you know, that, that that baby was born out of murder and adultery. Why in the world would it be, be in heaven, many would say. And yet, clearly, that baby is in heaven. And so in terms of the culpability and the age of accountability, some Christians would say it's like seven. Others would say it's 12. I think you're grasping at straws saying that. I, I think based off of what you have with David and based off of the heart of Christ, children i mean look at him he's always welcoming kids and kids were considered despicable in that day, day and age even the disciples said what are you doing this is despicable these, these children so based off of what you have with david there as well as how jesus treats kids i think it's a really tough case to make to say that somehow kids are going to be in hell okay thank you Stu. um this one doesn't specify that it's for Stu, but i think it is um christian altruist believes in judgment day atheist altruists no judgment day both are selfish equally how is god necessary for morality i think alex might be able to 
put some two cents on this one as well after. Yeah, you want to go first, Alex? Sorry, can you say it again? I was distracted. Someone was messaging me. I thought I had two minutes to message back because it was not going to be for me. <laughs> say uh, so the, uh, Ted Lacoco uh, for four ninety nine says, Christian altruists believe in judgment day. Altruists, atheist altruists, no judgment day. Both are selfless equally. How is God necessary for morality? Uh, yeah, okay. So I guess what he's saying is that like... um whether you believe in God or not, the uh, altruistic act is basically just as altruistic, right? So an atheist doing an altruistic act is is um, doing something just as valuable as, as a Christian who does it. So um, that seems right. Uh, but then he was saying, well, but, you know, why do you need God then in that case? Um, I don't know that if, I don't know that the kind of equivalence on those two means that God doesn't play any role. I mean, a Christian is going to say something like that God is a kind of metaphysical ground of morality. So they have a different concept of morality at play. Um, so I guess, I guess, I, you know, the only thing I've got to, that's really helpful to say about that is just that it does seem to me that you, you know, that you don't really need uh, God involved in a theory of morality for it to be um, perfectly adequate to explain everything. Uh, just as well um that seems right to me there there are there are decent um secular theories of morality um just as good as as any theistic ones as far as i'm concerned so in that sense you don't need god yeah, as as a part of theory building to get the job done um yeah so i guess that's my view what do you say Stu? i think you need a god who is personal to say what is truly right and wrong. And you need a God who is loving in order to grasp at what is this love that is intangible beyond just neurochemicals, say oxytocin, for example. And so as a moral realist or a Platonist would say that there are moral standards out there that we don't have to attach to a, a God. I, I, I think that's a better argument than you know, a relativist. But at the same time, I, I, I think all of these intangible moral concepts like justice that we have, you want a personal, every, every single time we encounter them, there's a personal side to them. Like it's not just robotic. They're not, they're not just like the mathematical laws we have in the universe. No, they're, they're very personal. Justice, love, empathy, truth, honor, like a personal being creating them makes way more sense to me. And this idea of judgment day, I mean, if the atheistic position is right, then you just got to suck it up. I mean, you got to be, I would say you got to be Gnostic. You got to be, you know, you really got to be a, a tough guy, tough gal to not get depressed, especially if you've gotten a poor shake in this life. You know, if you're a crack baby or if you're a woman who's had five correctional surgeries and her husband gets off scot-free, then there is no judgment day. Ultimately, hopefully the police will catch them, but we know the highest percentage of those women who are raped on college campuses, their perpetrators are never caught. And that's just like, suck it up too bad. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and so judgment day, they're going to be held accountable, but maybe there's not a judgment day. And, and so I think, I think we need to be honest if there's not a judgment day from an atheistic perspective, which there can't be a judgment day if, if you're an atheist, then we need to do a little bit more grieving and justice will look very different in this world here and now, if there is no judgment day compared to an understanding of what justice truly is, if there is a judgment day. I see okay, okay. Stuart Let me just you jump up a little, in. Alex, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> um, because obviously this is the whole thing we've been talking about the whole night, so it's really difficult to just not say anything. But I mean, okay, yeah, it's true. If God doesn't, if there's no God, nothing like that, and it's just, you're just here and now and then it's over and there's nothing, um, and there's no metaphysical justice, absolutely, 100%. So if you do something bad and then just kill yourself, nothing else follows from it because you're just dead and that's it. There's nothing. Um, okay, that's fair enough. But then if we're talking about the Christian um, case, my whole point this whole evening was to say, on the Christian story, there's no justice, right? <laughs> because these are cases of injustice too. So like, yeah, okay. So some woman's like raped by some guy, but then he repents and he like comes to Jesus. He's not getting punished. There's no there's no justice there. She would be pissed off still. Like, hold on, you raped me. How are you in heaven? 
I don't want my rapist to be with me in heaven. That's fucked up. Like, it just feels to me like uh, it's really easy to say, oh, there's no justice on atheism. All the justice is over here on Christianity. My view, I think, is there's no justice on Christianity either. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ch I just wanted to chuck that in. I'm not trying to trigger you. Stu. Feel free to have the last word. I just, you know, I got triggered. So I, I just wanted to get that out there. I agree with <laughs> no, Alex. It's... Feel free to have the last word. It's a good point. It's a really good point. But I would say as somebody who's just going to go rape somebody, I think their heart's going to be pretty calloused. And I don't think they're going to be like, oh, Jesus, let's have a Jesus moment and I'm into heaven. Like, do, like, do you truly believe that that's what a coming to Jesus moment is? Like, I, I don't read that in the Bible anywhere. I, I think it's a true, honest heart change. And again, whether it's a rapist or whether it's somebody doing some type of crime that's way smaller than that. Yes, we do want second opportunities for ourselves. And I would want a second opportunity for even Hitler. But maybe maybe that's unjust of me to desire anybody who's done any crime to actually get a, a, a second or third opportunity at really changing. And so you get endless opportunities, but they have to obviously be genuine and they are backed by justice. Like there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, there's so for example, there's been abuse in the church, right? Where women have been fondled. And it's, oh, just forgive. And what we're trying to do, doing, I and others, are showing that that's not the biblical basis for justice at all. Justice is, yes, you forgive in your heart so you get inner freedom, so you don't have to live in your mental space with being raped. But then justice is justice for the perpetrator where there is a type of meted out penalty. And so this whole idea of let's just skip over justice and just hop to cheap grace, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Okay. Um, so next question from Anonymous, $5. If Jesus is God and man, why would he yell, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Who's that for? I'll throw it in the air. First one to catch it can answer. <laughs> Alex, go ahead. Well, so that's what Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, I think. He doesn't say it in the others. Um, and in Mark, I obviously don't have a huge understanding and appreciation of, of this, but I my limited understanding is that in Mark, there's a version of Jesus where he does, you know, sometimes tries to do a miracle and gets it wrong. The disciples don't understand what he's on about. It's a kind of um, anti-hero kind of narrative. It's kind of different to how he comes, uh, how he's portrayed in other in other versions of those stories. So I guess the point is that at that Mark is portraying a specific narrative, kind of um, surprising anti-hero narrative, and that's why he's saying that there. But the question is like, but if he was like fully God and fully man and blah blah blah, and that it seems to me like it's imposing a different notion of Christology onto the story that wasn't in the intentions of Mark. And that's why it sounds weird. Uh, he, I don't think he thought of Jesus being like kind of um, like knowing that he's God uh, at that point. He doesn't know that. He doesn't really know very much about what's going on. So that that explains why he's doing that. It's a different narrative, different part of the Bible, having a different spin on stuff and saying it in a different way. So that would be that's that's how I understand that. I think that's what's going on there. But I, I imagine Stu's got a completely different view to me about that. So maybe he can explain what he thinks. No, that's that's interesting because not even the Son of Man knows when the return is going to be. So not not even Jesus Christ knows the the day and the hour, and so that shows his finitude to a certain extent. But obviously, he claimed to be Christ throughout the Scripture, whether it's the seven I am statements in John or him being crucified for saying he forgives sins and or whether he takes worship and doesn't tear his clothes and say don't worship me like like peter does so he's clearly making the claim to to be god and he clearly does things like miracles and the greatest miracle is the resurrection and yet you know alex makes an interesting point i i've never really thought about does he lose his god awareness when he's sweating droplets of blood because he's dealing with that level of stress and pressure now, I don't I don't think he ever loses his God awareness fully, but it shows again the wrestling match of his humanity and his divinity. 
and God punching a hole into space and time in order to actually relationally and physically tangibly get to humanity while remaining God. I, it, it makes sense. And yet at the same time, there are a lot of gaps in scripture that don't talk about exactly what that looks like. So I don't know what is going on in, in Christ's mental state when he's under that much pressure, when he's literally taking on the sins of the world. Yes, I, I think that could be fully human because he, he's taking on so much sin and evil. So, All right. Thank you, sir. All right, we have a question from Good Question again, this time throwing $10 to address Dr. Melpass. They disagree with you on one point. They say animals are moral agents. I have seen them do calculated mischief, take revenge, punish measurably, be intentional jerks, avoid harming when a warning is enough. Okay, so I do agree, I guess, actually, that some animals could be moral agents. Um, I don't think that it's just humans that are moral agents, uh, but I think it requires a capacity to um, understand some stuff. So, I'm, I mean, possibly, you know, higher primates, elephants, dolphins, something like that, maybe they can. Um, could my dog, I mean, maybe, you know, I, I do... My dog is socialized by living with humans all the time. So often she does things that seem like they, they so uh, I do. have that. Oh, where did that come from? Just had a random disembodied voice. Maybe I've had a Damascus uh, moment. I heard that too. <laughs> Maybe I don't not. know where it came from. <laughs> oh, well, it wasn't clear enough. So I still don't believe in anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, I, okay. Yeah. Maybe some animals can be moral agents, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, your average kind of tooth and claw example of like a lion eating a gazelle or something. I, that's, it just seems to, it's silly to think that that's um, a, a case where the, the lion has the same type of moral responsibility as, um, you know, a sort of sentient and rational human that understands and reflects on their actions and stuff. It's, it's not like that. So, yeah. All right. Very well. Um, from Ted Lacoca, maybe it's Lacoco. Um, uh, okay, so Stu, they say uh, that your claims of a straw man uh, was you on your heels. Uh, they are advising that Taoism helped them from not getting so angry. So I guess someone was challenging your temper a little bit during this debate. Was that person kind of a snowflake? They're probably yeah, snowflake. I do not know them personally. I could not tell you. All I know is it was worth $5 for them to comment this. First off, I apologize if I was too intense. I will say that Alex said the F word, though, and I did not curse. <laughs> so I put it fully on Alex. No, Alex is very, his temperament is very peaceful, which I really enjoy. And I apologize if I got too energetic here. It's, it must be the stress of the baby coming. The baby's coming any second. But no, Alex has been very, very kind in this debate. And the only moment he was triggered in a moment, but he was kind in his triggerment other than the F word. I got triggered with my energy because me, what I was getting from Alex perhaps was not fully what he was meaning. But what I heard was was very, tr very triggering for a moment. When it, it was kind of this, it sounded to me like this whole, oh, we're just chalking everything up to a mystery. And we've been saying that this whole time. So on on my I, I don't think I was on my heels. I, I think I answered it as honestly as I possibly could. If you say I was on my heels in the sense of. Uh, heels was my word. I tried to like make sense of, to... The, of the question a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I thank you for that, Justin. Jeez. Wow. Kindness. More kindness. So. So, no, I, I could be on my heels in, in a sense of, you know, I, I can't I'm not going to be able to fully break down in the most clearest way possible a couple things in Scripture. And, and I said Trinity. Atonement. Um, predestination, free will, like like I think I can get close to the line of clarity. But those are three big ones that I, I don't think I'll ever be able to say. You know, that's why when Alex brought up this debate topic, I was like, oh, this will be fun. This will be interesting. 
because I'm not I this, this is not one of my strong points in terms of debating the atonement. You know, that's William Lane Craig and others who've written books on it. So so no, I don't think I was on my heels. I, I think I wanted to to go. I, I'm a little I'm a little not annoyed. I, I think I'm a little uh, despairing right now that we didn't get to Alex's other good points, because, again, original sin is fascinating. Very interesting. I think we could have gotten into it, to it sociologically as well and psychologically. And then salvation piece too would, would have been interesting. So, so that was, that was my piece there. I, I, not to just go back, this is not a, a gotcha or anything like that, but Alex made a second ago, the, the comment of the road to Damascus experience and, and that he didn't get clarity enough from that voice that just popped up. I think that gets into what kind of clarity do you want? What kind of evidence do you want? And even the, you know, even the most famed atheists, you know, Alex, I'm sure is up there that I've had, uh, you know, I've debated on this channel and others, always their response is, there's no evidence, but I don't know how much I would need. I'm like, wow, that that is very interesting. I, I don't even know where to begin with that one. That is such a cop out. And I don't think Alex would take that position. But, but that's what I hear. And I don't know how much evidence Alex would need. And then secondly, whatever that experience Saul had and his incredible change to Paul, okay, we can, we can mock it and say, Oh, it was this bright light that knocked him off his horse and maybe it was an alien or something, but whatever that experience was historically in scripture and extraneous sources as well, there, there was a pretty crazy transition in his understanding of justice. So that gets back to exactly what we've been talking about tonight. His understanding of justice before was all about the Talmud and the rabbinical law, as well as Jews were considered way higher up on the pedestal than other nations. And and you better stick to the law or you're a nobody. And nobody taught it better than Paul. And he was one of the most famous people in the world at the time. So he has this experience that all of a sudden radically changes him. And nobody can explain why historically. Maybe, again, maybe he was, uh, maybe it was a type of psilocybin or, or DMT that he had in some of the bread or something that before his travels. And yet that radical shift for him to build the entire church is you need to explain it. You need to find a way to explain it. So that's one of the pieces of evidence that brings clarity for me, even though it's, it's having the opposite effect on, on Alex. Well, if I can just also say, um, I don't, um, I didn't come presenting this argument with the kind of attitude of like, Oh, I've thought all of this through. I'm definitely right. Um, no one can say anything that can defeat my ultimate ponage argument that I'll dish out now and whatever. It's not like that. I don't um, have that type of attitude towards these things. So like, um, it's there's loads of stuff about this that I also find mysterious and my knowledge doesn't go very far for the first person to put my hand up and say that. So I was only really like making the argument um, like uh like the like a chess opening i don't know if you play chess Stu, but i do play chess quite a lot and um you can like learn you know an opening like the sicilian or whatever and you play the first couple of moves you kind of like learn how that works and you get to know the landscape a bit but you know 20 moves later it's it's a completely unique game at that point you don't know how it's going to go just because you like like the first couple of moves and that's why i think about the argument that i was making I just liked the idea of like going into this conversation at that specific angle and just seeing where it goes from there. So I, I wasn't like thinking, oh, this is, this is, I'm going to win. I'm right. Anything like that. It was just, it, it's a curious and interesting way to have a conversation about these topics. So I, I didn't want to come across as, you know, as ultra confident, know it all kind of douchebag, you know, I, <laughs> I might be no, a douchebag, but I'm not a know it all. <laughs> I, I didn't get that from you at all. Okay. And it it's it's a, it's uh, inspiring me to look into it more often because the atonement typically does not come up in in most debates and and so no I even though I saw it as, as a big challenge and a learning moment I um no I'm glad you I'm glad you brought this up and no I, I haven't thought at all about and I think you're a very humble atheist it's just it's just I get so frustrated with with so many atheists who peg Christians as dogmatic when when I run into atheists who are the most dogmatic of, of all it's, it's kind of like and I'm not saying you're one, you, you don't strike me as one, but it's, it's just frustrating because it's like, it's like those who think for tolerance are the most intolerant of all oftentimes. So that, that's just what I've found. And, but no, I haven't gotten that at all from you in terms of the atonement. I think you've, you've taken a very humble stance and I thank you for that.
Uh, and perhaps I was a little bit of a snowflake on the question. Uh, I, I felt it might have been a tad on the harsh side. And I was <laughs> just reamed by the question asker in a super chat um, that I have failed him. So I apologize. <laughs> I will not allow that to happen again. And Ted Lococo asks another question immediately. Here it is, word for word. Stu, there is no not mystery in God. It's all mystery. Yeah. yeah. See, again, back in the 1500s, in the Middle Ages, and still in most cultures today, the understanding of God is just, it's fully accepted. It's, it's obvious. It just makes sense. Now, whether you say it's from upbringing or, or whatever it might be, the knowledge and experience of God from 87% of the entire world starts to shatter that argument alone. And in the Middle Ages... You know, you eventually had a lot of different natural disasters that occurred, especially a big earthquake in the 1700s later on, where all of a sudden, where where Alex lives in his neck of the woods, as well as where I live, people got to this point. And then later on, you get Hume, obviously. So you just channel it down through the Enlightenment, where people are becoming more and more certain of their knowledge. And they have a type of omniscient vigilance and a type of... I, 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 God, if there is a God, he must give me every piece of evidence imaginable until I see it fit. And then I will believe in him. Like, like suffering and evil, obviously discount God. Oh yeah. Alvin Plantinga would disagree. He would say, how in the world do you know that? H how do you have that type of omniscience where you could say suffering and evil discount God, that there's not any type of potential goodness that comes from evil and suffering, that there couldn't be any type of reasoning that comes from suffering. So it's it's from it's from Hume. It's from the Enlightenment, where it's what this Lococo kid is talking about is basically all on my type of human reasoning, and it's a very Western idea, where he was he's swimming in it in his culture, where he, where it's a the buffered self that Charles Taylor talks about, where it's all no longer even check out the transcendent, and by doing so, we're simply in this buffered type of self that doesn't even look upward; it just looks inward. And I have to have all of the correct reasons and evidence in order to truly believe. I don't believe Alex. Again, I don't believe I, I'm not trying to stereotype all atheists. I'm just saying where Lococo is coming from. It seems like a very emotional standpoint to say that it's just mystery with God. I think is completely discounting the thousands of years of intense debates of thousands of different debaters on both sides. So when I hear the last person I debated on, on this channel again, say, there is no truth whatsoever in Jesus Christ. He never spoke a truthful word. God, there is no truth whatsoever. He literally said that to me 10 times, and he's a very respected atheist. That is what I'm talking about right there. No honest, genuine historian or scholar would agree with that. So, um, Can okay. I just say one or, one or two little things? I just, sure. um, I do think that... Uh, if your religion doesn't carry with it um, a kind of a, what's the word? This might not be the right term for it, but like a um, kind of an apologetic charge or something where like your duty as a Christian is to kind of try and get other people to become Christians. Like not, not every religion has that. As far as I understand, I don't know anything about this either really, but um, I don't think that's part of Hinduism, for instance. I'm not sure it's part of Islam either, actually. Um, but if it is part of your religion that you're supposed to go out and persuade other people to become religious, it's then that the appeal to mystery starts to become a bit more problematic because like if, if I'm just religious, but I don't care whether you want to be the same religion as me and you ask me to explain it. And I say, oh yeah, it's just all mystery. I'm not saying you said it, that everything was a mystery in Christianity, obviously, but like, suppose someone were to say that about their religion, it, it doesn't really matter if they don't have to try and convert you, but if they're supposed to convert you, then it feels like you've got this kind of corresponding obligation that it should make sense then, right? Because how are you supposed to persuade someone to believe in it if it doesn't make sense? So mysteries and the apologetic charge do kind of pull in the opposite direction to me. Like, I don't, you know, anyway, it does seem to me that that was a, a tension, right? And I, I wouldn't blame it all on Hume. For me, it feels like the problem is that you're supposed to persuade people of stuff that you don't understand. Right? <laughs> That's really hard, right? How are you supposed to, like, that's where the problem comes into. But anyway, that was just my two cents. I'm not trying to, you know. 
see again logically if there's a god of the universe and you're going to grant that god total omniscience and he created the entire cosmos like like shouldn't we have a certain level of limited knowledge and then you know maybe your rebuttal is yeah but we have we have zero evidence so 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 to hear atheists never say that is so frustrating for me they're, they're never like yeah we have limited knowledge and, and you know biblically our thoughts are not as high as as god's thoughts yes that's correct if you're granting an omniscient being who created everything you're not going to get every piece of evidence that you so desire and i know it's frustrating it's frustrating for me too because i want god to show up right now and pop up as the fourth bubble right now in this debate and just show himself and he can prove that to all of us and we don't need, we can stop debating now okay but is is that fair to treat the god of the universe that way so i know i think it's an interesting point in terms of yes Christians should always look at God as a mystery. I think if you don't look at his, uh, God as a mystery, you're lying through your teeth. I think if Alex is saying that there's not mystery in his origin, the meaning of his life, where he's headed, then he's lying through his teeth. Of course there's mystery. And so, so no, I, I think a Christian sh sh you know, sharing the good news better say that there's mystery or they're totally lying. I, I think that's interesting. Hindus share their faith, but not to the extent. Like I've talked to a Hindu woman, and she, she wanted me to become a, a Hindu. Um, Muslims in the past, unfortunately, have well, they definitely share their faith, and it, many of them. I was just in an Uber, and he was sharing his faith with me, and he was very kind and humble in, in his in how he was sharing it. And then many atheists, many atheists share their faith, um, obviously strongly. You know, Alex is doing that to an extent right now, right here. Unless this is just an intellectual exercise, but I think he's sharing. Oh, his... Well, you know, it kind of is. I mean, I I don't care whether anyone believes what I believe. You know, why not? We're not we're not attached to the truth. Why wouldn't you want to take the blinders off for me? I don't understand what that means. Sorry. If you don't want me to become an atheist, but you're saying atheism is the correct worldview, then I'm buying into an untruth and living a lie. So why wouldn't you want me to become an atheist? Isn't that love the loving thing to do? I mean, that might be one of the many. I mean, for all I know, you believe 15 other false things. I don't know that that's the most destructive one that you believe. I mean, should I care most, more about that? I don't know. And maybe I'm, uh, maybe I don't think that you should become a Christian. Maybe, maybe, maybe if we got to know each other more, I would say, actually, you should be a Christian. Don't, don't even worry about atheism even though I think atheism is true, because I think it'd be better for you not to believe that because you can't handle it or something. I don't know. But there's loads of reasons why I might not want you to become an atheist, even though I, I think that atheism is correct. There's loads of reasons why I might not think that you should believe that. Uh, there's just simply no apologetic obligation on me, as far as I'm concerned, to change anybody else's mind on this question. It just, I don't care if you believe in atheism or not. Well, many... I, I don't think that, it, that you're a better person if you're an atheist. Right? Maybe you're a worse person if you're an atheist. I don't know. But I, I still think it's correct. And I, I still don't care whether you're an atheist or not. Like, There you go. That's my perspective. Well, I would certainly hope, though, that that's an interesting perspective. But the majority of atheists I debate, they'll, they'll say, you know, I don't want you to be a Christian anymore. I want you to be an atheist because, you know, I don't want intelligent design back in my kids' school textbooks, or I don't want you to be a Christian anymore. I want you to be an atheist to see the light and understanding that, you know, we did come from nothing and that you don't need a creator to create us all. Or another try to convert me because he said, you know, I could become violent because of the Old Testament passages on what the Israelites did to the Canaanites and others. Uh, another one tried to convert me because of the idea of original sin. And how that's debilitating. Another one tried to convert me because of uh, sexuality, uh, sex ethics. So, so I think it's good for atheists if they strongly stand on a lot of these different points of, that they should convert Christians. But I might want to change your mind about those issues in particular. But I don't suppose that you have to stop being a Christian. I mean, there are Christians who take all sorts of views on all of those questions, right? You can yeah, be true. able to. A Christian who's totally down with people being gay and bisexual and oh. transgender or whatever. So I don't have to convert you to change your mind about that question. No, I'm just giving you an example, though, of, of atheists who do try and deconvert me. Yeah, right. Well, I think they're confused. I think that they're acting in a weird, confused way. 
if I'm I honest. still think I, I take I take issue with your point though because I'm still if Christianity is my enti entire identity if I'm built up in that even if say I'm a pastor doing a lot of great things for people and so you're like whoa whoa I I want him to remain a Christian because he's doing so much great you know psychological work with people spiritual work with people let's just keep him a Christian I, I uh okay great that's very kind of you in many ways and and serving to the populace. But but in the other way, what what if I wasn't doing that much and my entire entire identity was still wrapped up in Christianity? Or what if I was still doing that much? You're still allowing me to buy into a lie, a full deception, deceiving myself all life long. And I'm going to be spreading that news to others. So you're going to allow oh. the propagation of deception and there's going to be manipulation involved because yeah. they're going to be sharing the good news. Like you, you better not want me to be a Christian, maybe a humanist, but but if I'm a Christian by the book and really holding to it, I hope you would want to deconvert me. That'd be the loving thing to do. Uh, but, maybe we're getting into a potential debate topic. For another the, debate. Another yeah. do, you, do you Let want me to just say one last thing? Two and, bits and there then, first. Sure. Look, I think that there's whole there's loads of things that might be more important than that. I mean, like, are you destroying the environment, or are you like? Um, unnecessarily like attacking state institutions that look after vulnerable people because of your like um, economic ideological views or whatever. Maybe your religious beliefs are not even that important on the big scale of things. They're just one of the various lies that you believe, right? And maybe I believe a whole ton of lies too, and I don't know about it, but it's very black and white and reductive to just sort of suppose that this question must be the one that I care most about trying to change your mind on. It I didn't say both. I didn't say most. Okay, I, but but it would be reductive were it to be necessarily that you zoom in on that question above all of the others. So I suppose what I'm saying is that um, I'm not convinced it's the most important question about somebody, whether they're Christian or or whether they're religious or whether they're atheist. There's way more interesting and important things. If I was to try and change your mind about something, it probably wouldn't be this question, right? It would. I'd probably be focusing on something completely different. That's, Agree. My, that's my perspective. Agree. Yep. All right. Moving along, Sparky Steve drops two dollars to comment that Stuart's gonna need God tonight. Alex is a beast. <laughs> Truth. Truth. Facts. <laughs> this has been an enlightening conversation. I've enjoyed it. Well, good. You were bored at one point, so I've turned it around, fortunately. What's that? <laughs> you, you no, I was bored. bored with that topic. I was never bored oh, okay. with Okay. Don't worry. I was never bored with you. Moving along, Ted Lococo, another $2, says, So Genesis 3.22, God needed us to not be in his image. No, that's wrong. I don't know what translation he's pulling from. The Imago Dei was, was central right from the beginning in, in one, what, 127. And there was nothing about not in his image. It was cre created to mirror God not to be God. And there's a major, major difference in that. We have some of God's quali qualities anthro in an anthropocentric kind of way, morphic kind of way, and um, and yet we, we definitely are lacking in the incommunicable and communicable traits of God. So there's a radical difference. All right, moving along. Arcade Outpost for $5.00. Jesus is a dramatized Yom Kippur ritual. Christianity is a Judaic spin-off religion to get historically contentious guys into the Abramatic matrix. Whew, tongue twister. Don't ask me to say that again. No, I, I don't agree I don't with that. Understand that. I think for for Jews... They were to be a light to the nations. They were the chosen people, but that does not mean in any kind of way more special than the other civilizations. So again, it was that it, it was an inclusive, it, it was an exclusive type of civilization that would become incredibly inclusive in every kind of way. That's how God created it to work. And then you get in Ezekiel, you get throughout Isaiah, especially Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, his bones were broken for us back to the atonement. Everything is pointing to Jesus Christ as a historical figure. You're still not convinced. Fine. Well, then why were so many thousands upon thousands of Jews converted to Christianity in such a short period of time off of this supposed resurrection? 
when they would have completely thought that it was a general resurrection at the end of time. So that's a hard case to make, and I, I won't continue. I, I'm not, not going to bore anybody here. <laughs> All right. Um, Sparky Steve with 10 pounds. Stu, you've admitted you're borderline atheist. You should cherish these moments to learn from the likes of Alex instead of running the same ideological script. You're almost there, buddy. One final push. Well, like we just said a minute ago, probably knocking on the wrong door if he's trying to find reasons to become an atheist, talking to me. Um, because I won't be any help, I don't think. Um, I guess, let me just say slightly, I think one of the reasons I came up with this argument in the first place was just I was trying to think of reasons why I don't, why I'm not um, a Christian. Like, why am I an atheist? You know, like you said, am I just raised an atheist and that's why I'm an atheist? And I think to some extent that's true, actually. Um, so I was trying to find, even if it's post hoc, some kind of like way of explaining what I find implausible about Christianity. That's that's what I was doing, I think, with this argument. The clash between what God it seems like to me depicted in the Bible and the notion of justice that seems plausible to me is one of the reasons why I find the religion um, not attractive and not plausible. So I, I, I guess if you liked my argument, maybe that would help you become an atheist. But it certainly wasn't my intention to it was, you know, I'm not an apologist, so I wasn't trying to change your mind. If anything, it was autobiographical rather than apologetic. Hey, I got to leave here. So, Alex, you can answer the rest of the questions. Okay. My wife, my wife uh, she might be having a baby here. Okay, cool. Well, good All luck. Right. I think just ending on this, the reason why I'm not an atheist is because I believe a worldview that's credible is tied up in the evidential as well as the experiential. And atheism has a good amount of evidential pieces to it. I think in terms of the challenges of, of other religions. And yet I, I think it's, it's ultimately lacking greatly in the experiential side and what makes a strong identity, what, how, how we make sense of what we've been talking about tonight, justice, sacrifice, these immaterial things, you know, how do you make sense of objective meaning and purpose? How do you make sense of hope versus optimism? How do you make sense of, you know, suffering, how do you make sense of beauty, the arts, you know, so many, so many of these things are just tied up in our experience. And the majority of people I know who come to Christ, many do through the evidentiary arguments that, that one we've been talking about tonight, but a ton of them come through experience. And you have that scripturally as well, the woman at the well and many others, where it, it's the experience makes sense, you know, whether it's in prayer whether it's the in the act of forgiveness, whatever it might be that atheism is lacking in because atheism is so tied to materialism and that there's no immaterial out there. It, it's lacking in a in a comprehensive worldview. It has some some good arguments from an evidentiary perspective, but ultimately it's lacking. All right, Alex, thanks so much. You would have had a good response to that, but I got to run here. So but appreciate you. And congratulations. Uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we wish you all the best, Justin. You are excellent. Thank you, sir. I'll do what Fresh. I can. All right. all right, thanks, man. Thanks, man. thanks okay. guys. See ya. See ya. Um, well, that's uh, an abrupt way to uh, kind of. Well, I think if there are, if anyone's paid super chat money to ask me a question, I think it's only fair to give them a cursory guide. It doesn't sound like there's going to be a huge number. They're mainly for Stu. Uh, the sounds of it, but yeah, they were still coming in. Um, it's an, an, an amazing audience tonight, frankly. Um, we had people asking Stuart a whole lot of other questions yeah. here. Well, I can't answer those, yeah. but I could probably have a shout if there's one or two for me. But if not, we can call it a night. Well, here's some that were for both of you here. Um, Sparky Steve, again, for five, five pounds. Guys, what's your thoughts on Allegro's theory on Jesus myth originating from a mushroom fertility cult in the local Israeli area make a lot of sense? Well, I've literally, the first time I've heard of it is just now, so I <laughs> have nothing to say. Doesn't sound very plausible. Yeah, if you super chatted, guys, and you didn't get your question read and it was for Stu or uh, whatever, I'm pretty sure Modern Data Beta's channels, I've seen and heard James many times before say, you know, if, if you want your super chat back, 
Um, he's got no problem doing so. There were some big ones here. We were coming into some $20 Super Chats. Um, let me see here. Here we go. Uh, from BM, five pounds. Alex, what are your thoughts on the OT prophecies? Old Micah 5, prophecies, 2, Wisdom 2, 12, 20. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22? Well, I don't know any of those references off the top of my head, and um, I'm not going to try and look them up right now, but I think I don't find the idea of prophecy in general um, to be good uh, a reason conferring um, things. Like, it's, it's too um it's too problematic right there's too many things about it that um are difficult to to see how it's supposed to work for you to go oh he made a prophecy and it came true so it means you must believe in it like um if you like the, the i suppose so like if i just say uh you know in in a week's time like such and such will happen um that's like kind of a prediction. Like I can understand if it's just something completely independent of me that that's just unlikely. Like um, it would be kind of weird if I just said, you know, this time next week, I don't know, the sun will be obscured for five minutes in the middle of the day, but it won't be an eclipse or anything. It'll just go out and come back again. And it, like, how, how weird would it be if like that turned out that it that does happen next week, right? Um, but why did I say it? Like, where did that come from? How did I know anything about that? It, if it's not tied to anything, that's just a guess that came true. Um, so that's obviously not a prophecy. If it's based on like a theory, if it's like a prediction of a theory or whatever, like, you know, Einstein's theory says that, you know, that's going to happen. That's not a prophecy either because it's based on something um, like it's just a consequence of a theoretical, uh, of, a, of a scientific theory. Um, I just don't really know what's supposed to, like what, what the model is like god knows everything that's going to happen in the future and if he says i don't know i just find the whole thing very confusing and uh i've yet to see uh, an example of a prophecy that that even looked roughly like it made sense to me but i think like the least impressive apologetic kind of idea is is to appeal to prophecy maybe that's not a very good explanation maybe i need to think a bit more about how to explain that properly but not impressed with any that I've come across, although maybe there's one in there that's somehow really impressive that I can't, that I haven't seen before. Very, very, very unlikely as far as I can see. All right. Um, yeah, there isn't too much left here. Just uh, okay. Ted Lococo again chimes in what the last second, um, says his wife is having a baby, but he monologued his outro, suspect <laughs> question mark, seems that way. Um, Ted, I can tell you with absolute certainty here, and, and, and Alex here will back me up, before the debate even started, uh, Stu warned us that this was a potential, like this was coming up to a very important day for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, the debaters come out here on their own time. Alex is in another country overseas. Um, we literally saw the sun go down his window. Mm. So, you know, the, the time... A four-hour debate, uh, life is bound to jump in every once in a while. Uh, so if it's suspect, maybe. But Stuart has been a supporter of the channel for a long time, so he gets the benefit of the doubt. Um, again, if your Super Chats didn't get read because of the uh, of Stuart missing, uh, feel free to reach out to Modern Day Debate. I'm sure they'll, they'll help out. Um, so, <laughs> so Ted Lococo is... is, is a very active viewer at the moment. He just super chatted again uh, to read all the chats and let Alex answer them. But um, <laughs> I mean, they're very specifically either to Stu or they're from Ted. Um, and, and Ted is already not my biggest fan at, at the moment, which is unfortunate. Uh, I was really hoping for my first debate out to be a rock star, but you know what, with time I'll only get better. So um I think you've done I don't well. see anything well. here that you're qualified to answer on Stu's behalf there, Alex, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, so with that, we'll just, we'll, we'll end the debate. Um, guys, remember, I see a lot of people in the chat. Where's James? Free James. Uh, James is desperately struggling and preparing this live debate next weekend. So 
get your tickets in the uh, description below. Um, if you're not able to make it out to Houston, Texas to see the live show, then you can go to the Indiegogo campaign um, and, and show your support with just a few bucks. Uh, otherwise, it comes out of James's coffee money, and, and we can't allow that. Um, I mean, he's a Starbucks guy, I believe, so that's like three cups of coffee if he has to pay for it, right? Um, Alex, uh, I didn't get a chance to get a proper goodbye to Stuart, but Stuart, if you watch this back some, uh, later at some point, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Alex, Dr. Alex Malpass, thank you for coming all this way. <laughs> No problem. Today. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. That was an absolute pleasure. Uh, everyone, uh, remember to like and subscribe to not miss any more debates on modern day debate. Have a great night, everyone.